at all level, at all level. And if you look at the whole region in this country, there are skill centers, honorable speaker, where youths can go and learn skills. See, are are not nowhere. Most of our youths, they want to go and learn skills, but all of them cannot come here simply because of accommodation. So I think it's need for government at least to look at two areas, one in Sami, one in Panchang. Yes. So that those around here can easily come to Sami. There, there is a place, there is a camp. It's just that higher education and Minister of Transport, they can see each other and discuss how they can transform that camp to a skill center. The camp is there. And even in Panchan, I'm sure if they face them, they will give them a land so that those around area can also come up. Thank you. <laughs> Honorable Speaker, I now move to petroleum and energy. Uh, in the report, the rural and electric expansion project, it is going on, and we are told in the report that by 2025, it will be universal. It means everybody will be access to electricity. And in that one also, if you look at the past report, it has stated the level where they are. But this year, they don't tell us at what stage they are, which district they are, which region they are. It is not stated here. They just say that 685 communities. Where? Which region? And that's why I said a report should be well informed. At least if you stated the region, one can understand, yes, it's this region. Honorable Speaker, I move to our office of the Vice President. National Disaster Management Agency. We all know disaster, it must happen. So I think this body, we should try and create a budget line for disaster. Why I say that? Anytime a disaster occur, before they respond, it takes time. Before they respond, it takes time. Everything is put on centralized. Before you have that, it takes time. You go on so many protocols. And when people are suffering, why not we say this amount is for disaster? So that when it comes, the people can easily go and do their expenses on it. Honorable Speaker, 30% increment also is mentioned. Yes, I said it here. When this 30%, we are approving it, I said it here. It doesn't help. It helps only those who are, you know, receiving high. But the low earners, it doesn't help them. What we need is to restructure our salary. Honorable Speaker, let me move to transport, works, and infrastructure. There are so many roads that are under construction. In fact, during the fifth legislature, we visited Hakalan. But Hakalan, there is nothing mentioned about what percentage Hakalan is. Roads at Kaun, those ones are not in fact mentioned. Nyanija, they are not mentioned. And those ones 
We approve them here in this parliament. We don't know at the level of implementation of those roads. Sankandi to Karantaba also, they have already laid the foundation stones. At what level now? Honorable Speaker, uh, let's look at page 39 of the report, page 39. Page 39, number 11. The ferry service play a vital role in linking the North Bank and South Banks, although ferry service crossing remain challenging. In the year under review, the ferry service authority move Banjul Barra route service and restore Barajali ferry service and continue to paralyze Bush Town crossing point. Very serious. When I saw this report, I was very sad. It means this ministry, they don't know Bush Town crossing point. Very sad. How many patients die at that crossing point? How many people die there? It's a very sensitive crossing point, Honorable Speaker. The only major hospital, Bansang, people must cross that route. It is in a very serious situation, as I'm speaking to you, Honorable Speaker. And that crossing point is not mentioned. It seems the, the ministry did not know what is happening there. I want to know. What is their plans towards that crossing point? It's very serious. They should do something to fix problems there. For colonial days, our people are pulling, 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 and we are still pulling. There was a time when uh, the, the, the election is just about to you know, begin. They brought a motor uh, uh, ferry there. All of a sudden, they move it. I don't know where it is now. I don't know where, where did they move it. I, I don't know. I don't know where they move it. You are not working. You are not the ministry, please. May I observe you? On a... No, 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 please. You see? They should fix, honorable speaker. It's the only referral hospital there. Honorable Speaker, let me look at the uh, legal, legal sector. It is mentioned, the President said he wants to craft a new constitution. 116 million was spent on the draft. And now, they said they want to craft a new constitution to spoil our resources again. Because this draft, remember, Honorable Speaker, they went around all the country. They went up to Europe, abroad, to take people's views about the constitution. They came up with this draft. It is people's voices. Our people said, they want our country to be run like this. It is from our people. And we rejected. The National Assembly members rejected it, where I am part of it, because I cannot exclude myself. I cannot exclude myself, because Parliament is about number. It's about number. Even though I reject it, during my liberation, I said I, I want the draft constitution to come, even if I say that. But many people, many people say that they, they don't want the draft. Many people say that. Point of order, point of order. No, I, I, 
It's not about you. Uh, who, is, who is with the point of order? Yes, member for Wuli is. Can we hear the point of order? Honorable Speaker, uh, I refer members to Clause 33 of the standing orders. It said it shall be out of order. Sorry. Not that one. It's Clause, clause 29, 5. Uh, no, 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 not that close. <laughs> I, I made a mistake. But what I, honourable, that that close, that close. Yeah. Wait, 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 honourable. It's me who is making my order. Is 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 seventeen F. 17F, behavior of members. While a member is speaking, all other members shall remain silent and shall not make any unseemly interruption. We must allow the member to make his uh, deliberation so that when you come to make your deliberation, nobody will interrupt you. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker, for uh, Honourable Member, yeah, I think the Honourable Member is right. Let's allow members to express their views on the issue. If you have a different view, you will take the floor and you come out with your view. And if you want to make, if you want to observe and the member still, still does not sit down, please keep quiet. Please, Honourable Member, can you continue? I want to observe you. Please. Honourable Member, you can continue. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I know people who said, I want to observe you. I know they are going to say something which is going to be... Honourable Member, can you, you know, just take the floor? So, uh, <laughs> those who are... Don't create more dialogue right, thank you. This. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honourable Speaker. I'm still on my feet. Um, what I'm saying is, is that... Um, so much amount was spent on the drug. That's my opinion. Why you said you want to craft a new constitution again? Let us look at the, the draft one and come to terms and save money for the country. You want to tell me that you want to go back again, consult people? Why that? I think we should not allow that. Let them bring the draft. And we look at it. The things that we don't want, we compromise. You see? But a new one, ah, it's left to them and all of us. Honorable Speaker, it's the same constitution. Ministry of Land, Local Government, and Religious Affairs. When you look at their report, they also talk about Local Government Act 2022. It's the same law. Because what is in the Constitution is the same law that is in their Act. Look at. And when you look at, Honorable Speaker, Section 25 of the Constitution. Everybody have right to be in any political party that you want. Everybody have right. Why should you dismiss somebody? Because of you are not in the same political party with him or her. You are violating the Constitution. 1997 Constitution. You are violating it. Our tears. Our alcalos, they are not free because they are appointed by somebody. And it is only this house that can save them. Only this house can save them. This country needs good laws. We want good laws so that you and I can move freely, can make best choices.
No, it's crazy. Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker. We need to change this country. Okay, it's the same local government act when you look at it. All of us here, we, the National Assembly member, if you serve for two consecutive terms, 10 years, you are entitled to a pension. When the, the, the councillors, the ward councillors are not entitled to pension, it is, all, it is not in their act. This is why, when they bring it, you know, the executive, they are doing what they're supposed to do. Anything before it is passed, it must come to this assembly. We should look at the interests of our people, not the interests of any other party. Interior, Honorable Speaker, we all know security is an important instrument. Even all of us here, we need guides. This country is not safe, Honorable Speaker. It's not safe. The way things are moving. You should know when to go out. It happens to current minority leader. Our, our time, somebody came to the assembly and attacked him. You think that people are not looking at you? People are looking at you. You all, when ministers have security, why not national assembly members? You need security. You need security. That person came and attacked him. And we are here, we said yes. <laughs> Don't look security. <laughs> if you are, be very careful, honorable speaker. This is why, and when we look at our stations, especially those at the up country, we always been hearing armed robbery, armed robbery. How can our security can easily access? To those culprits, they must have mobility. This is a constraint for them. They don't have mobility. Most of the police stations, they don't have good place to stay much more mobility. Go to Karantaba and see how those people are struggling. No mobility. When armed robbery came there, how can they reach there? They have no mobility. You know, Honorable Speaker, we have to prioritize. We have to prioritize. This is why I'm saying anything that comes, it is the rural people that are suffering. Here you can take tax. What rural area, where are you going to take tax? A taxi. Where are you going to take a taxi? Where? Those places should have mobility. Honorable Speaker, we are tired of saying this constraint over and over, over and over. At least, when we see a mobility at Sarangai, a mobility at Karantaba, a mobility at other stations, we can say, yes, now, the state, state is now responding to our needs. But when they are saying, yes, we want to maintain peace and stability, how can you maintain peace and stability when you are not mobile? And, Honorable Speaker, when you look at page 55, number 8, it's talking about fire. And again, I'm coming back again for the same region. For the same region, CRR not, no fire station. For the same region, from Balangar up to Sametenda, no fire station. And there is always fire outbreak that nearly burned people's houses. 
When there is fire disaster, they manage on their own, which also needs to be looked at. Honorable Speaker, I'm just about to conclude. Um, when you look at the President's conclusion state, number 10, he talks about number 10, page 62. If you look at it, page 10, uh, no, uh, page 62, number 10, where he is talking about the function of the uh, a National Assembly member, our function. He is talking about it. If you go through it, you will see it. That is oversight, representation, and legislation. And we must be firm on those things. When we, we are firm on those things, the whole Gambia is relying on us. When we fail, the whole country will fail. This is why each and every one of us here, you think our people are not looking at us? Our people are looking at us. How can you tell me to wrap up when you take people's time? <laughs> when he was here, I did not tell him to wrap up, and he's telling me to wrap up. <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm saying I'm about to conclude. Now, does not mean that I'm wrap up. I'm, I'm coming. Okay? Honorable Speaker, it's the same page, page 62, number 11. It's talking about peace, how we can maintain peace in our consequences, in the Gambia, and everywhere. And Honorable Speaker, I will say this, what I saw in this parliament on Wednesday, I have never seen that. The five years that I was here, I have never seen that. And I will mention it. And if at all we want peace, we should not allow that. Why we call here a National Assembly? It does not belong to any political party. It's national. They don't say NPP, they don't say UDP, they don't say any other party. I saw Yai Kompins in one of our committee rooms holding a meeting. Let's stop it. Let's stop it. And it is from MPP. Yes? Yes. I, I saw the, I saw them. Point of order, point of order. No, no. no. Stop that allegation. I saw no. them. No, but that's not true. Here. Point of order. Honorable, can I observe you? Order. No, 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 please. Let me just wrap. Please speak to yourself. I saw it with, the, with, 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 with their distance, written it on it. I entered in one of the committees. There are, there are witnesses here who saw it. Who saw it. And if at all, if we want to turn here to a political party, you have meeting here. Another a political party also have meeting here. We, what peace are we calling for? What peace are we calling for? We are not calling for any peace. So we want peace. This country belongs to all of us. If I want, I can be in any party. We all have our bureaus. We all have our political places. Let us go and do it there. And for, please, let us leave the assembly. Normally, when there are this kind of address, nation's address, those who normally organize is the National Assembly and the security. The National Assembly and the security. But this year, what happened? I have never seen it. And let me make a stop to it. It is in me, if I don't say it, you know. So this is why I have to say it. Because we want to, we want, uh, to bring peace. 
Honorable Speaker, number 12. You know, we are National Assembly members. And we are leaders. As a leader, whatever you are saying, say something that will bring peace. Say something that will bring peace. Because our people, they listen to us. We educate them. We tell them what is really. We should not tell them something which you know that it will bring conflict among ourselves. We should not do that. That is why he said, educate your consequences. Honorable Speaker, on that note, I thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank you, Honorable Member for uh, Sami. Uh, uh, honorable members, during this deliberation, we have had very beautiful and brilliant suggestions from honorable members. This is a debate on the president's speech. We have very vibrant and powerful oversight committees that all of us belong to. I, if we will spare time, those committees will always table their reports to the plenary, and decisions will be taken at plenary. I will have suggested it would have been better if most of what is being said today by individual MPs could have been captured in their various committee reports and recommendations made, if agreed upon, recommendations made for Parliament to move ahead. Otherwise, we are going to turn the whole thing into an adjournment debate where people will be talking about individual things and all these things. Uh, we, I now invite the Honorable Member for Fony Berefet. Thank you so much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Vice President and the Ministers. And I'll also want to thank my fellow Honorable Members for working very hard in order to raise the development of this country. The debate here is based on the SONA, which is very important. I'll also want to thank President Barrow for coming here and do this, his duty. I want to address on agriculture because we know that agriculture is the background of the development of the Gambia. As an agri extension agent before, I know how important agriculture is in the Gambia. And for Gambia to go forward, I think we need to look on agriculture very well. In the, the other area of agriculture, the other area of agriculture where I want us to observe is on procurement, the bidders, procurement and the bidders. Whenever we want to bring something in the country here, we need to observe the type of bidders we, we should give to. For example, somebody who don't know how to, to bring this fertilizer in the country, you give that person to do the business. It is going to be difficult. And that can lead to the higher price of fertilizer. And that is disturbing our people in vegetable production and also farming in, in the country. Honorable Speaker, I want the Honorable Minister of Agriculture to take this system of farming in the Gambia into consideration. That is integrated farming system. We cannot embark on to submission farming only or just to farm only to eat. We need to venture into integrated farming system, which is like vegetable production in one farming. We do animal husbandry, food processing in one farming. That is like you have your own farm, you do vegetable production in the same farmland, you do the value addition, you do animal husbandry. From there, the waste product of the animal, you can use it to your farm. 
and also turn it into biogas, agriculture will grow more than this. And Honorable Speaker, one of us was asking whether the youth of the Gambia want to work. I would say that the youth of the Gambia want to work. I am a youth, I was an agri-extension agent, and I was an entrepreneur. I trained more than 50 youths on value addition. I trained more than 100 youths on, on value addition and vegetable production. And those women in the Gambia, and those youths in the Gambia are ready to work. We are ready to work. We don't want to depend on the government. This complaint in the Gambia, it doesn't mean that I'm supporting Baro. I am an independent candidate, and I am here for the people of the Gambia. The betterment of the Gambia is my concern. For Gambia to move forward is my concern. If the youths are hungry over there, they don't have anything. They don't have nothing to do. Obviously, they will attack the government. But I want all the ministry of the Gambia to try this. Make the youth busy. I am a youth. I know the way we are. Make the youth busy. Give the youth what they want. Integrated farming system. You can employ many youths in that project. And those youths will never think of agents in the country. But if a youth man sat for, for the whole day drinking attire, what will be the next topic for them? They must against the people and the government. Every day, they go to social media to mock us. It's simply because they don't have what to do. But if the youth are busy, they are occupied on any other things where they will generate money, they will never talk about the people. That's why I want agriculture to look on those areas. I know other projects like NEDI and uh, GIZ uh, and other past they are trying a lot to train youth on entrepreneurship. But after training, what is happening? After training, what kind of money did they give us? A grant of 50000 with a high price of all the raw materials. What are we going to do with that money? There are many things we, we, we import in this country. The youths are in the Gambia who can do it. There are many youths in the Gambia who can do it. Come and look on, on this bleach soap. When I say bleach soap, it's not bleaching soap. It's sample. What is available? Gambians youths can do it. We bring it from Senegal. I know, I know the youths I train, and I know the youths we train together in Cameroon and in Benin. They are here, a lot of them. We can make sample, we can make other sample. We can make many things. We can make different kind of juice you people are importing in this country, and you are spending a lot of money in importing food in the Gambia. Youths can do it. Make the youth busy, please. Honorable Minister, Honorable Speaker, I also want to talk about this thing that the, the, my fellow honorable who said human wants are unlimited. Yes, human wants are unlimited, but when you go to the same topic, subject of economy, we can say that human wants are scarce in the Gambia. The scarcity of human wants needs to be addressed. This is why people are fighting, people are doing bad things. Human wants are scarce, the demand is higher than the supply. We need to address on that. Honorable Speaker, I want to also continue on health. Honorable Speaker, without health, we cannot move. I know Ministry of Health, they are trying, but I want them also to do more scrutinizing, to do more observing on their fellow nurses. What is happening? Why are we dying, the women of the Gambia, during labor? Why are we dying? I don't want people to blame God. Sometimes it's lack of proper care. Why are our children dying? I don't want you people to blame God on unnecessary deaths. It's proper on care. Honorable Speaker, I want to put this job to the Honorable Vice President to do, in his, to do his job at times. Let him go on surprise visits to, to different ministries. On surprise visits, unexpected. He will see something he don't wish to see. This is the Gambia. The corruption they are saying is not only the ministers, but the people of the Gambia are corrupt. We need to change. We need to change. For the country to move, it's not only the minister or the president. The people must be willing to work. Perfectly and honest.
We hold the Holy Quran to swear that we will do our duty as a Muslim. If you hold the Quran and swear that we will do our work, every institution, every ministry, every working place, you must be honest because Kullu Nafsi is Aikati Mauti. Honorable Speaker, I really want the Honorable Minister of Health to help us. Health, the way we are moving, is not good for the people of the Gambia. In fact, other, we are here, we are elected here, and we always listen to the people who vote us here. They always complain about this health insurance, that with the health insurance, you will go to the hospital, after checking and everything, you will not have the medicine. They will ask you to go and buy the medicine somewhere. What is the essence of having the health insurance then? What is the essence of having the health insurance? Uh, okay, if we say so. <laughs> and also, Honorable Speaker, I went on oversight to where I noticed that all most of the hospitals in the Gambia are lacking many things. No medicine, no him, lacking human resources, and other machines which the nurses need in the hospital. I think the minister should try much. And also, I know the government has invested a lot of money in health and agriculture. All of these two ministries and other ministries are important. But to whom much is given, much is expected. So agriculture and health, we expect a lot of changes in your area. Please, this is what we want. Honorable Speaker, on the Minister of Youth and Sport, the youth of the Gambia, I will still continue. The youth of the Gambia don't need only football alone, though football is important and other sport. But also, youth want entrepreneurship. Youth want to work and have money. I will keep on saying this. I am an independent candidate. I don't hate anybody. And I cannot hate a son of my fellow woman. But I will tell the truth. We are seeing many deaths in the Gambia. Killing, killing, murderers everywhere. What is going on? What is going on? People are also blaming the president. Some people may say that you should not blame the president. He is not the one doing it. No, the reason why people are blaming him, he is the leader. He needs to talk. A leader's voice must stand, and whatever he said must be implemented. If anybody is doing wrong, sack that person. If, if anybody do the killing, punish that person and even keep him there. Let the people not see him again. But after killing, in three months or one year, you see the person going. What will happen? My husband, please, here is not the married room. We are working. <laughs> Honorable Speaker, Honorable Speaker, I want to talk about this uh, Sankule Kunda project, Rice Field Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. That rice field rehabilitation is not going well because I think they gave the contract to one person by the name Fabi Fo. Those farmers are complaining about Fabi Fo because the project should take a, a period of uh, 13 months and the project now is more than 13 months. The farmers don't have any place where to, to do farming and they are complaining. Please, I want the Honorable Minister to go and check about this Fabi Fo issue. We cannot give contract to the people who are not willing to work. We cannot give contract to the Gambians or the, or the foreigners who are not willing to work. And also giving things to people without monitoring is not correct. Monitor them. When you give them anything, the money don't belong to the minister or the person. It belongs to the Gambian. Whatever you, you, whoever you give the money to, need to be monitored. 
So this is the problem of our, this country. We spend a lot of money on many projects, on, 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 on other people. After, we, we don't use to even bother to monitor the people. And the people will use the money anyhow they want. This country belongs to all of us. If the Gambia sink down, we will all sink down. Honorable Speaker, I will take this opportunity to advise all of us and the Gambians. Sorry, don't say it like that. This is a problem we are facing. People using even the slightest mistake of the president sending it to TikTok, to everywhere. It's a mockery to the Gambians. We look low, very low, compared to other, Gamb other foreigners when we go out. I have friends in Cameroon, I have friends in Benin, I have friends in Nigeria. They do call me, sending me the videos of our president. Do you think we are mocking the president? We are mocking ourselves. I don't support the president, but I hate the attitude. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Fongi Brefet. Honorable, I think I mention. I will, Honorable Speaker, I will, I will, Honorable Members, I will constitute the, the committee, the minority and the majority, and probably two senior MPs to reconcile husband and wife. <laughs> I now, I now invite the Honorable Member for Sabak Sanjal. Uh, thank you, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. I want to acknowledge the presence of our Honorable Ministers and the Honorable Vice President who was here with us. Uh, we are very grateful that you are here on this um, important occasion. First, I will thank um, Honorable Fonyi Brefet for that wonderful deliberation. You've said it all. Um, to avoid repetition, I will just want to be very brief. Um, Honorable Speaker, I think the topic on the floor has to do with um, First, I will say attitudinal change. Because when you talk about good governance, we don't only have to be mere consumers, but it is important to note that we should be participants and also co creators. Um, for that being the case, we are talking of state of the nation address. When you talk about the word state, it should be a particular condition that is actually happening in a particular period of time. That is my own understanding about the word state. Having read this report, it clearly manifests some of the great achievements that have been done by various ministries. But I find it also very difficult to find some of the challenges that are faced by these ministries. It's like they made it very colorful and presented to the president without outlining some of the challenges that they face in their various ministries. Various speakers made mention of some of the challenges that people of the Gambia are facing. And each and every challenge that has been mentioned here affects one minister. At least it should have been factored in this report. When you talk about basic and secondary education, I put the, the two together, and also higher education. Honorable Sami have made mention of Section 30 which is one of the fundamental human rights of citizens. It clearly states that secondary education, including technical and vocational schools, should reach every 
citizen of this country. But if you go to certain parts of this country, this is like a dream to them. It has never been achieved since the inception of this country. Um, you go to the office of the Ministry of Health. The president has made mention about these ambulances, which is very good. But we were all here a few weeks ago when we approved the 30% increment. It is mentioned in this report as well. That is a very great achievement. But in order, the low-income earners have not seen themselves in that. So I'm suggesting that even if we are not going to touch that part of salary, we should at least look at ways of increasing allowances for them. <coughs> Under the Ministry of Health, for example, if you come to Nguyen, there are some health officers who are renting. And the smallest amount of money they can pay is $1,500. If you deduct that from their salaries, what are they left with? The ambulance is a very good thing. But most of these ambulances are not monitored. We've seen some of these community ambulances, which are meant to be in the communities on which they were allocated. But we've been seeing them in the combos for their private businesses. At least they should be stationed in their communities because that was the purpose onto which they were given out. The 30% increment that we increase, the salary increment, it was a political campaign that uh, um, 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 it was a word or a promise that was made by the president. And it was tabled before this assembly. We all approved it. Because always, President's words are always translated into policies. The same political promise or campaign promise was made to my constituents on the Ministry of Health. He promised to give us, in Sabah World, which consists about 37 villages, a health center or a health facility. I am waiting for the ministry to do something about that. Because if the president makes a promise, it is translated into a policy. So I hope that you are putting that into consideration. I am very much grateful with the Honorable Minister of Sports. Honorable Speaker, some people are not happy with him. Personally, I am very grateful to him because he has been criticized and he accepts, which is very easy. When people attacked him with all these words, he came in the open and said, I'm sorry, this is the money you are talking about. It's here. We should commend him for that. You see, it's always easy to criticize, but it's also good when somebody does something in the right way. We, 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 we recommend that what he has done is right. At least that would encourage his colleagues. So I want to thank him for that. Honorable. Are you calling me on order or do you have an observation? Oh, thank you. Our member for Woolies, can we hear the point of order? Hmm? Honorable Speaker, you have only made a ruling that uh, the man's name is not mentioned and is not included in the debate. You've already made you Please, please, my honorable members, can we hear the po his point of order, please? I said you have already made a ruling on this matter that we don't mention the, the name of the, 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 the person because it is not mentioned in the report. But the honorable member is coming back to the same issue, and I think it should not be allowed. You, uh, honorable member for Wuli is you are in order. Honorable member, can you continue, please? Thank you, um, Honorable <laughs> Speaker. So it's like what I'm trying to say here is um, attitudinal change 
is what will um, uh, resolve all these problems that have been discussed here. So you go to Ministry of Tourism. Um, it is always said that they contribute 25% of our GDP. Tourism. Two, two paragraphs on this report. And they made mention of a multi-million dollar project coming to the country. To where? How much? How much is that money? Where is it going? Nobody knows. It is just mentioned, but they did not even tell us where they are getting those fundings, to who those fundings are going, on to which projects are they going to implement those fundings. At least when the COVID-19 came, whenever you talk about tourism, they say we have excuses because of the COVID-19, we could not do so and so and so. When the COVID-19 came, it was in a year where a certain amount of money was allocated for you to travel, for fuel. Did you return it to the country? No, you retained those monies. Where was it spent? And you come and give us this report, two paragraph pages. At least those fundings that were meant for traveling, those, those monies that were meant for fueling should have been returned to the government coffers. Or you even take your, some of your people on leave. Because we have seen it happen in other companies. I was working with the tourism industry, with FTI International. When the COVID-19 was coming, I was then in Dakar with some tourists. We had a call immediately that we should all come back. The company is shutting down because of the COVID-19. Meaning, all those resources that we were supposed to spend for the next three days has, had to be returned to the company. So if tourism were supposed to spend, let's say, 50-something million, at least the part of that 50-something million should have been returned to government coffers. We can use it on health, we can use it on agriculture. But nothing. So you see, Ami, you, Ami made mention of uh, of, of so many things, and which I don't want to go back. But as he said, uh, we are Muslims, and we ha we, some of us are Muslims, some are Christians, but we all stood here and swore into the Quran and the Bible. So if we are to do anything illegal, we will be accounted for in the, uh, in the next um, 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 war. So it's very important we put that into consideration. Kuljal haq awalaw kana muran. <laughs> Even if you are to be killed, speak the truth. It's always very <coughs> important. Mm. <coughs> so when you talk about petroleum and energy, this is also a dream to rural areas. At least we know that um, electricity is in pieces, but they should have captured it here and explained to the president that Yes, definitely we are bringing electricity in this country, but it is in phases. At the moment, we are in phase one on this part of the country. But in the future, we will be going to phase two, and this is the implementation method. And then people will be able to understand that definitely the funds or the monies that we are paying is coming back to us. In, if you go to my constituency, over 57 villages, only three, only three villages have electricity. The rest, nothing, absolutely nothing. Yalalba is close to Farafen, less than one kilometer, to extend three, five, seven poles to get to Yalalba and supply them with electricity. You move the same poles from Farafen to, uh, to Tungi and Sanja, and you left all those villages that are within that area, over 37 villages. Are we serious? We are not. So, fisheries. The river Gambia divides this country into two. We also need fish in rural areas. When you talk about fishing, they always center themselves in uh, Tanje, Gunjur. For us, we have this uh, uh, Yai boy coming from Senegal after seven, eight days. And we have the river there. We have some youth who, want to, who, who are doing wonderful to make sure that they get us fish. And they use the limited resources that they have. At least Ministry of Fisheries should be able to at least support those youths who are living in the rural areas to be able to engage on fishing. There are so many projects that are coming. But when these projects come, the first thing they think about is vehicles. The project phase out, another one is coming. Finding the same vehicles, you think about vehicles again. 
At the end of the day, you say auction. Even that auction is not done properly. You will be calling your friends at night, come tomorrow, we are going to auction vehicles. Is that right? That is not what we need. Interior. Uh, the last time I saw the committee, they went round. And you know what is happening in the police stations. The president made mention that under the Ministry of Education, they are building quarters for schools. They need it also. You go to Ngen Sanja, if a police officer is, have, uh, is renting, he has to pay at least $1,500. That is the smallest person that you can occupy. At least they need quarters. We have a whole piece of land for them, a big one for that matter. At least they should be used you know, to build quarters for them. And some of these camps that are used to, uh, by, by, by these contractors, like if you go to uh, Salum, they, they, they have this camp there when they are constructing these roads. It's for you, uh, Honorable. Yes, so at least those camps can be used by the police officers. Uh, you know, they are well equipped with AC and everything. They also deserve AC because those periods, you, you know, it, when the, during March, April, May, it's very hot, so they need it. So at least the police need to be motivated. And about their allowances, it's very sad to say we are giving them allowance of 250. So I am not saying we increase the salary, because if you increase the salary, you tax it back again. So let them increase allowances. This is what I'm saying. So they need it. <laughs> it's not that you are sitting behind me, so I'm just saying the truth, you know. You are afraid. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not afraid. I, you know, youth and sport. So I made mention of youth and sport, and I thank him so much for that um, bull initiative that he has done. But also, he has to see that, you know, we have Gaucha, Gambia Wrestling Federation. Sport is very wide. It's not only about football. Me, myself, I don't watch football. The only thing that, you can, that I can watch in this country as sport is, is, is wrestling. That is what I know. I don't know Messi. I don't know those people. I don't know them. So the ones I know is the ones I'm seeing in the Gambia. These wrestlers, you take them into granted. Go to Senegal and see what their wrestlers are doing. Mohamed Tyson is having companies, and he has employed lots of citizens. And it is through wrestling that he is getting it. Wrestling is our own sport, and we can invest on it to make sure that our youths are engaged on certain sporting activities, and they will also be able to gain their employment. So it's not the only, football is not only the, the sporting activity that we can do. So let's encourage um, 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 wrestling and also spend much on wrestling. I think that will also help. At least the former government used to do that. They used to invest a lot in, in wrestling. So um, I'm, I'm encouraging the Honorable Minister to, to, to work with Gaucha and then see how they can reform and refurbish the, 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 our own sports, our own local sports. It's very important. Yes. Um, you go to foreign affairs. He, the, uh, the president made mention about these remittances from our diasporan people. Hmm? They are bringing a lot of money during festival Tobaski or, or, or Ramadan. Everybody will be rushing to these Western unions to receive money from their people in Europe or in America or in Asia or anywhere in the diaspora, I can say. But at the same time, Time and again, we will be receiving deportees. And you say, these are the people spending much money on, your, uh, on our economy. But at the same time, every now and again, you see them deported. Are we ready to accommodate them whenever they come? And it's threatening. Because if these people are coming, they don't have anything to do. At the end of the day, you don't expect them just to be sitting like that. They might attempt to do things which might not even in favor of this country. So we try to see how we reintegrate those people that are deported and see the territory that at least they engage themselves in certain activities. With that small token that they are given in the air, at the airport, they cannot invest on anything. So at least it is very good that we reinstate them and at least socialize with them, include them in the system, put them into good use. Some of them have learned so many skills even when they were there. Some of them are ingenious, some of them are technicians, some of them are very, very intelligent. So if we have them here, we should be able to share and gather those knowledge that they have. You, we have seen Peace Corps coming in this country. Although they are not deportees, but they come here to learn so many activities. That is why if we are saying, let us learn best practices, 
from, from Europe, let's learn best practice from, from America. They come here and they learn from us, and the information that they gather from here is what they develop in turn, they bring it back to us and then sell it to us, which will be very much expensive. So we have our people who have been there. When they come back here, they come with so many talents. Because when they go to Europe, they are integrated with the, with the, with the, with the people there. So they have learned so many skills, and whenever they are deported, we should be able to make very good use of them, and not just to leave them on the street like that. Some become frustrated and start drinking alcohol, using drugs and all that stuff. Works and infrastructure, one of the most important elements of development, transport. Recently, we have seen uh, a, a drivers' union having rather with, 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 with this ministry. At least, the reaction that I was expecting from the ministry is not to say, buy land, you have to you have to That is not correct. Call them and then dialogue with them, listen to them. They have their concerns. You at least dialogue with them. But if you say, okay, police, they are going to supply us with their vans, what was the purpose of giving those vans to the police? It, the purpose was to transport their own people <coughs> to go to work. So within the time frame that those vehicles were allocated to, trans, to, 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 to remedy, remedy the situation, what, what impact is it having on the other people the, the, for which those vehicles were allocated? Those two days, you see many of them, those police officers, standing on the street begging for lift because they could not have those bus services that they used to have. So you said you are solving one problem, creating another problem again. So the reaction of the ministry, I was not happy. At least he should have called them to come and then sit with them, dialogue with them. It, if, if it was campaign time, if it was campaign time, they would never react like that. They would have called them and talked to them. But because they know it's not campaign time, we don't need them now. If it was campaign time to, 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 to bring their, their militants here during nomination day, they will not do that. The ministry would, have, would not react like that. But they know that it's not campaign time. We don't need them now to bring people from Samet or bring people from Savasanjal. So we don't mean, need them. Let's just look at them like this. After two days, they will be frustrated and they will come back to the system. That is not what they were supposed to do. Call them and dialogue with them, listen to their problems, and try to find ways of solving them than just leaving it to their hands like that. I was very disappointed with them. Still on, trans, on, on works. These roads they are constructing. When awarding contracts, award to the right people. NRA, they have a key role to play in this issue. You know, whenever you talk about development, people will start to blame the government. You see, they are not doing this. The funds are there. We have all the necessities, but are they put into good use? National Road Authority is the biggest problem we have in this country. How many millions of dollars are we paying as Gambians to construct roads? After one year, everything went in off. After two years, you cannot, you cannot even imagine that this was a road that was constructed. Honorable uh, uh, Central Badibu made mention of uh, Farato Jambu Road. Go and see the condition of that road. Just go and see the condition of that road. And this is taxpayers' money. So the corruption they are talking about is right. Because back in the days, if you talk about contractor consultant on a particular road, if the contractor sees a consultant coming, they even start to tremble. Because they know that it is the con consultant that puts them on the right path. But nowadays, you see a contractor and a consultant, you think that they are the same father and mother. They don't even care. <laughs> At night, you, go, you just go and scroll. You see consultant vehicle parked in the gate of a contractor's company. What are they doing there? Awesome. There shouldn't be any good relationship between them. The only relation that they, have, that they should have is to make sure that the specification of the contract is put into good use. No, no, he's my guy. Thank you. You can observe me. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I know you are very, uh, you are very uh, uh, hot, but when you mention of contractor and consultants should not have a good relationship, that can be very bad for the project. Contractor and consultant need a cordial, 
a very good relationship for the rest of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK, uh, the good relationship that should exist should be based on the specification of the rule, and not other, otherwise. So I know what I'm saying. Not on corruption practices. It is undone, and we will never tolerate it to happen in this country. I was a consultant, and I was working with Gamex, posted at Kaur. Go and see the condition of that rule. Go and see Jambu, uh, 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 Sukuta Jamba and Jelly project. I was part of that project, and I was part of the consultant. Me, I, I don't have friends when it comes to work. You were here, I raised you on point of order, and you were not happy with me. When you are observing me, I sat down and allow you to observe me. <laughs> so that is it. We have to make sure we work as a nation and, and move ahead. If, this, if we say we are building a house, and Honorable Njai said, I want to build the house like this. X said, no, that is not a good way. Let us build it as, like this. We have different views. But the objective is to build a house. So at the end of the day, if the contract is awarded to Mr. Njai and you know that exactly what Mr. Njai is doing is not correct, give him your ideas for the benefit of the project. In nation building, this is what we need to do. We cannot all be presidents. One must be the president. If you have your own ideas and you said you need the country, you are not given the opportunity. Those should not stop you to contribute for the development of this nation. We should synchronize everybody. This, we all have heart for this nation. Everybody here. Somebody will be speaking. Sami wanted to cry here. Because he had felt the difficulties that are faced by our people. So let us be serious and move as a nation. So under the office of the vice president, this class floats. It is not only Banjul. It is not only in the compass. This year, almost four people died in my constituency. I've never seen NDMA to come and see, not the office of the vice president to come and see. It is not only in Banjul. It is not only in the compass. When we talk about decentralization, it should be equal distribution of state resources. So what, when the flash, flash, uh, floods come, came, at least I was expecting that that huge delegation should have come from Combo to Sabasanja, at least to see those people who, who uh, lost, lost, lost uh, their family members. It's very disheartening sometimes. When you are going on political campaign or whatsoever, they are the ones who will be clapping, jumping, and stuff. When it comes to development, we are always left behind. That trend has to change. It has to change. We have to move as a nation. We are stuck now. And moving forward, recommendation of FPAC. Honorable Speaker, I don't know how will you make sure that the president gets this report on and, and act based on that FPAC report. Honorable <laughs> Jawara said the president doesn't listen to mu, 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 mu. But he can listen to what is submitted in front of him. This is nothing like mu, 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 mu because it is from, from the National Assembly. It's FPAC report. He can act based on that report. That is what former regime used to do. You do mass practices from the report of FPAC. We, we, ha we have heard from stories that during those days, you have F, uh, is it pack pack, blah, blah. That pack pack, the report came immediately. He acted based on that report. So if the F pack report comes, it shouldn't be placed under the desk. Let him act based on that report. Nobody will blame him. If they want to blame him, let him say, it is a report that has been brought on my table, and I have seen some malpractices that are happening in this country. Nobody will put blame on him if he, if he doesn't want people to blame him. Yes, I think that is, that is, that is, that is very important. Uh -huh. You see, this use of illicit drugs. Indians or any other country, I don't want to mention. I withdraw that one before somebody will call me on point of no order. But some of, we have seen some coming from, some investors coming into this country, bringing this vodka 22, Jägermeister, red wine, and all those illicit drugs 
some of these illicit drugs into this country, allowing our own youth to take it. Go to the streets, 22 year old, 18 year, 16, 14, you see them with these illicit drugs. What are we doing? So at least we should put ban on all those illicit drugs coming to the country. So the ministry, you have powers. We have given you powers to make delegated legislation. Bring it here. We will support it. To ban all those investors who bring illicit drugs in this country. And if we see them, we, they must be prosecuted. But this has to do with some of the uh, uh, business relations or some of these acts that we, we, we are implementing in this country. For example, this local government act. Almost two decades now, Honorable Ngai will build one small house. It will be valued for $5,000. And he is paying task of $200, for example. After six, seven years, he will erect a big mansion there, collecting ten, twenty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 every month and paying only $200. At the end of the day, those that are occupying that the same house will be littering the whole environment. And it is now the responsibility of the council to collect all those littering, to, 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 to bring them to the waste uh, uh, management. You know, and that individual is just paying $200 for the whole year, making about 40,000, 60,000 in each room. If you have about 10 rooms, making 40,000 every year, every in, for every room, you are making how much money? and paying $200 from that. So the act needs to be reviewed so that at least we will help uh, the council to collect more money uh, uh, for the decentralization to, to go on and go on. So if we want to talk uh, like that, the whole day we can be here. Like Honorable Central Body would did. If I want to follow your footsteps here, we will not move. So on that note, Honorable Speaker, I thank you very much for giving me the floor, and I thank you all members for also listening to my deliberation. Thank you, Honorable Member Uksabak Sanyal. In fact, your first statement was, I will not take time. <laughs> I was pleased, but I saw you going. Anyway, it's a job well done. I now invite the member for Combo East. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. First, I must uh, acknowledge the presence of Honorable Ministers here present. Um, my Honorable colleagues have said it almost all. I just have to elaborate on the left out, on the areas that they have discussed in the interest of time. Uh, Honorable Speaker, we've had the President. First, I have to thank him for the constitutional mandates that, uh, given, that was given to him and that he fulfilled by coming in boldly and comporting himself as a President and then speaking about what he had here. The, deliver, the, the speeches were attractive and then they were very touching, especially on the conclusion, on the concluding remarks, where I shall quote on his speeches, concluding speeches number nine, where he has taxed the executive and the legislatures to be much more patriotic and then be focused, be nonpartisan, and then see the interests of this nation. Gambia that we all belong to. This thing is a lesson to be learned and it's a tool to be, guide, to be guiding us. First, I must uh, touch on the Ministry of Finance where on his speeches, the Finance and Economic Affairs Clause 3, where he has uh, stated to say the revenues were dropped by 14% in the first two months of the last year. Here, again, he is also showing, trying to tell the strategies and the plans that uh, the country need to take up, the executive is planning for a robust economy. 
I shall contribute by saying a suggestion, putting in a suggestion as we should, the ministry should consider the domestic debt lending debt strategies that they are applying could also be a factor in trying to reduce our revenues because the commercial banks or financial institutions that avail those funds could be useful to the uh, individual businesses that government would be relying on to collect more taxes. In trying to do so, domestic taxation would encourage higher interest rates on loans for small-scale businesses and other farming enterprises. I would suggest the government to look into this domestic lending and at what rate are they, are they, are they borrowing, at what volume this borrowing would be. Again, in the area of agriculture, I've heard him explaining, explained a lot on agriculture, but a few was left out, which is key in agriculture. That is livestock services. The livestock subsector has not been highlighted here in detail. It's only the sector of poultry and poultry farming. But we understand in trying to sustain food self-sufficiency, these two things has to go together. That is the crops and the uh, meat market, and then the dairy, dairy farms. I've noticed that in our, in our country, Gambia, although it is not in, in, in its highest rate, but considering other countries within the sub-region, these two sects of farmers are the causes of instability. The farmers and the herders normally share the same sector. But I'm not seeing in this plan where government has made a plan of action in trying to create boundaries and sectors for this. We haven't seen any pastoral area for herdsmen and livestock owners to be able to rest themselves peacefully so that the demand for livestock products could be locally produced here. Because in the combos we have cattle, we have uh, small ruminants, but then their spacing is becoming worrisome. And it is prerequisite to the ministry to look into this and then at least try to identify. We've seen in our local communities, in the Combo Santotos, there are there are pavements, ways for, 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 for these cattle and other ruminants. It's now becoming a, a, a habitat for humanity. People are occupying those areas, and then these cattle owners are left with no choice but to migrate. And would this migration do well? We're seeing how uh, this extremism emerges in other countries within the sub-region. So in trying to mitigate that, the ministry should work on strategies in trying to manage the limited land space that we had in trying to create a specific area for pastoral farming and agricultural farming to avoid uh, confrontation in the near future. Again, getting into energy, petroleum and energy, we've heard very well from the president, and then it sounds good. But we would also expect the rural electrification to be well elaborated on in trying to give hope to Gambians, because we know electricity today is a, is a requirement for a human being to, to be living in this world today. In doing so, the rural electrification distribution should be looked into in trying to, especially within the Combos, the Combos and Totos, where we are coming to emerge from the rural way of settlement to a semi-urban settlement. And the congestions, the spacing that we used to enjoy is no more, you know. And this uh, congestion of people could be, as, uh, as, uh, uh, could be a way, a way, a, a way for for in, uh, bringing in some 
diseases or pandemics that could be transmitting. We know the world today is, not, is too risky. Uh, people are restricted and then these transmitting diseases could, could, be, could be very serious if we did not take uh, our, our settlements seriously. In this, um, we understand trying to make available electricity to Gambians. We know it is, yes, the high tensions will be, will be made within the settlements and also, but then the affordability to get electricity in your house, the transaction, the paperwork, the timing for one to get his electric meter to his house seem to be very expensive and the ministry should look into it by way of providing electric poles and other accessories that will help uh, beneficiaries to be having their electricity supplies easily and within the shortest possible time. Getting into the information and communication infrastructure, yes, we are emerging, but then looking into the standards that the world is today, comparing it to the Gambian standard, we have so many telecommunications and our lives depends highly on internet communication. And our ACE cables are frequently disrupted and this affects businesses and our daily lives. So the ministry should work on trying, should work on means in remedying this situation so that we would also meet up to standards. We, as we know, it is a global world. Gambia is not an island. You may deal with a counterpart where you will be, you will be failing by not being able to get the required uh, uh, resources and the internet connections on time to communicate. Getting into transport, works, and infrastructure. We've had the president stating that there are some projects that are designed for the greater Banjul area uh, within these times to come. Here, we would want it to, as the statement of the president saying it is, the activities are apolitical, let these distributions be made wisely within the greater Banjul area, especially the Combo Santotos, because they are the emerging economies of the country today. And most of them are people that contribute immensely into the, our socioeconomic <coughs> development. Getting into trade, industry, trade, industry, regional integration and employment. Yes, it has been well said here too, the ministry is working very well, especially in trying to encourage foreign investors to come into this country. Yes, good. But then, in what way and in what form? I think the angle at which the government is considering these successes, to me, I'm seeing it as in the area of revenue collections, in the area of taxation and other gains. But then in human resources, in the employment sector, we encourage investors to work into our country, have it register their companies, very easily pay lower tax, lower charges as before. But upon establishing, they tend to abuse and work under and engage our, 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 our countrymen by not following the international labor standards in trying to abuse them, in trying to create, give them jobs that are known without a choice or an option. And the ministry need to work on it by way of engaging the trade unionists in trying to come up with a strategy and an approach in trying to engage both the employer-employee so that it will be a mutual benefit for all. Would not just be a safe haven for investors to come in and then occupy our lands. At the same time, have cheap labor, maximize profit. But our people would not be realizing any growth out of that. And then it's been said here that the land spacing that we had is limited. If we avail all these resources to investors. At the end of the day, our people remain to be vulnerable. 
their farmlands have been occupied by, in, uh, by industrialists and agri ag ag agriculturists. At the end of the day, they might not be able to take up something tangible home to take care of their families or to grow to the standards of other people. It's like we will remain to be producers, but we will never be, we will be the primary producers. We will never be growing to be people that would also be taking over businesses within our own country. And then finally, I would be on lands, local government and religious affairs. In the land aspect, we understand Gambia is a very tiny state with a limited land space. We are seeing that the land management strategy is not being taking its shoots as expected. Most on, Honorable Speaker. That's very timely. In yes. fact, that's what we are discussing. Can you go ahead, Honorable Member? Honorable Speaker, I rise to move the motion that the Assembly to sit beyond 6 o'clock. To finish the order of the... In order to finish business. Any seconder? It's been upon you, me. So much, Honorable Speaker, I rise to second the motion. Honorable Members, it has been moved and seconded that the Assembly sits beyond 6 to finish the order of the day. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. Not in favour, say no. The ayes have it. Honourable member, you can continue. Thank you, Honourable Speaker. Yes, as as I've been saying, the the ministry should be working efficiently in trying to better manage the land the, 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 the land space that is left here. We've we've noticed that especially our areas in the in the in the Combo Santotos as it is the only area within the Greater Banjul area that has reserve lands for investors and companies. But the allocation of these lands, we understand these are state-owned lands, but the land tenure system is also showing there are, there are farmers that we are farming in these lands for ages, for generations. And in occupying these kind of lands, trying to do, there must be a consultation a committee that will be responsible to consult with the farmers so that the farmers will get informed before implementation. But what normally happens is they will just be occupying these lands, they see people getting into their lands with machines and machineries. The, tight, the, the address that they will give is it's a directive from the executive, we have no power over it, it is from the top. And the top is the executive, the executive is elected into office. So in this it may bring in disgruntlement and bring in some personal grievances between the executive and then the people of, the, of, of that area. So I would urge the Ministry of Local Government and Lands to look wisely into this, to be able to come up with strategies, approaches and, and, and establish committees to make sure that the, the land management system goes on very well with farmers so that they will also feel ownership of being Gambians and landowners. I thank you very much. This is all I have for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Combo East. I now invite the Honorable Member for Lower Badibu. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. I would want to acknowledge the presence of uh, Honorable Vice President and other cabinet ministers here present, as well as my fellow Honorable Members, security forces or security personnel, the media. Honorable Speaker, I would want to um, start my discussion with um, agriculture. You will be a witness with me. Agriculture used to be the backbone of our economy, but um, I don't think if that's the case um, as of now. Um, Honorable Speaker, the President has mentioned that 40% of our GDP comes from remittances. If that is the case, then uh, remittances has now overtaken what used to be the backbone of our economy, which is agriculture. I believe the reason why we are not getting 
more, um, more in agriculture is because we are not prepared to venture into more, more uh, mechanized system of farming. Um, uh, without that, I don't think if we can um, achieve what you know, we are uh, fighting to achieve, that is you know, food self-sufficient. It's just of recent, I saw the distribution of um, modern farming implements in one of our West African countries called Mali, by the military junta to the farmers in Mali. But um, on contrary, what I saw in the Gambia here some time back is distribution of donkeys to our farmers in the body bush. If I believe if we want to achieve what we are yearning for, we must venture into what we call mechanized system of farming. There we can reach to the promised land. I believe that um, another problem that is confronting our agricultural sector is that, uh, and this area is the area which we are claiming to have um, expert or you know, graduates, or, or, I, let me put it in this way, um, PhD holders. We have more, more PhD holders in the department than any other department. But are these knowledgeable, knowledgeable people trying to know, translate what they gain to our agricultural sector? I say no. One of the problems that is, of course, um, um, confronting our agriculture is um, the inability of our farmers to go in for these mechanized farming implements, for example, the tractor. So it is the duty of the government to provide tractor to our farmers, like what happened in the Second Republic. We all saw it here. Farmers used to have access to tractor here during the Second Republic. But all of a sudden, all those tractors we have withdrawn from them. Instead of you know, leaving it them and you know, uh, you know, by allowing them to continue using the tractor in a more, Point more order. Um, organized manner, we saw. Yeah, yeah. Of course, Honorable, there is point of order. Can we hear the point of order, please? Yes. Honorable Speaker, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Standing on order 30, Honorable Speaker, and scope of the debate. Debate upon any motion or amendment to a motion, or upon any bill, part of a bill, amendment to a bill, shall be relevant thereto, except in the case of a motion for debate on the adjournment of the Assembly. The Honorable Member should confine himself to state of nation addressed by the president. He has all these issues to say it during the argument debate. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Member, thank you very much. Sorry. Sorry. No. Sit down, please. Um, thank you. I think uh, it's the same issue arising again. The Honorable Speaker made a ruling yesterday on it, and that the president's statement touches across all sectors uh, of the country. And therefore, we will still continue to debate based on those issues. But however, as the Honorable Speaker ruled yesterday, let us do our best to confine ourselves to, to uh, what is on the agenda. But uh, that's the ruling of the Honorable Speaker yesterday. Continue, please. Thank you very much, Honorable Deputy Speaker. But I think the President has, of course, touched on um, agriculture. And the topic on this question is, is part and parcel of agriculture. Take care of yourself, my son. Let me continue. Um, I was saying, we, um, the inability of our farmers to have access to fertilizer is another desiring factor that is, of course, um, bringing our agricultural, agri our agricultural sector to its knees. I think if we want to achieve what we call food self-sufficient, we need to create an avenue for our farmers so that they can have access to the fertilizer. We all know the soil condition of the Gambia nowadays. The, now, the soil condition of most part of the Gambia, especially where I, I hail from, North Bank area, is not in good order because of the frustration in that area. The certification is now 
um, is, 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 of course, plain in that part of the country. So if our farmers want to come up with bumper harvest, I think they need fertilizer on their farms. Another factor that is, of course, um, hindering our progress in agriculture is, of course, um, um, like, I, like I said before, of course, um, loss of norm trees, most especially in that area, which I call the forestation, which, of course, um, um, can be this can be visible in that part of the country. I think I want to just ask that the uh, the ministers responsible of that, this particular area, that is the uh, Minister of Forestry, what are the plans that they have in order to, of course, solve this issue in our area? Because you know this issue has you know it's created a lot of havoc on our area. The case in point is um, last year powerful wind that of course struck that part of the country. Still, our people are, 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 are of course. Uh, with that, uh, they, are, they are still experiencing that problem in our area. Still, they are yet to not recover themselves from that area because a lot of animals have died during that hurricane. Another point um, is, um, of course, the issue of corruption, which is, of course, um, a contested issue in the country. I would want to thank most members who spoke before me, they all, of course, uh, spoke, uh, spoke, uh, spoke about corruption. This is the issue which you have, this is the problem that if we are not careful, if we don't cap it at the right time, might threaten the very existence of our country. That's peace, which we are known for. Gambia is known for peace, but corruption, is, is, corruption might lead to so many, many things that no, we don't want in this country. It can create anger and resentment into our population, especially the youthful population. I think the sole responsibility, or the, I will, of course, um, hold the president to tax in order to cap out corruption in this country, because he is the, he is the chief, executive, chief executive officer of this country. People are saying people are not involved in into corruption. Yes, no, they must resign, they must resign. How about if they, want, if they don't want to resign? If, like I am a shepherd, I have my herd of cattle, or, or, or my herd of no sheep. One of them happened to know, enter into somebody's farmland, and the person reported the matter to me. What do you think should I do to my animal? What do you think should I do that, to that animal? I'll, I'll, I should control that, that animal. If I still treat you that I, can, no, I was unable to control the animal, what I will do is, of course, I will sell the animal or to slaughter the animal. This is why I believe in Chinese model of carving corruption. That is, if you have found you know, one thing, of, of course, you know, tampered with public phone, if you have found one thing, you should be killed. That's my stand on it. Because you have been killed or you have killed thousands of people in this country. Look at it. it. It was just recently that I saw um, uh, a video of one of the officers in Senegal that you know, he's, you know, he's looking for phone to pay for her medical bills. Those corrupt officials, they are also contributing you know, part of that problem. How this reason will we have enough you know, equipment and the medicines in our you know, hospitals here? You think that lady will travel from Gambia to Senegal to seek for medical attention? No. I think. Honorable Deputy Speaker, the Speaker, no, Honorable Deputy, it's Deputy Speaker, not the Speaker. So, oh, so I, I oh, sorry, sir. I think, <laughs> I, I think, Speaker. Yes, go ahead. We are here not to know, but uh, to try to brush the top most part, part, uh, part of this table and put everything under the carpet. No. We have to tell each other the reality, what is, of course, happening in our country. Corruption is key factor, which is, of course, drilling our development. And if we don't cap it out, not to cap it out only, but on time, right now, we need to arrest it. It has to be arrested. And you know, when we say corruption, we think no, it's just no, you know, you know, monetary matters. No. There are people in this country, civil servants, they are not going to work on time and they leave their offices not on time. All, all, all those things are corruption. You swore to 
to Holy Quran and Bible that you're going to know, you're going to do the job. If you can do, if you are not prepared to take it off, resign, leave. Simple, like you know, what my, my honorable member said, honorable Jawara. If you don't want to hear the truth, leave. We are going to tell you people the truth. That's it. Security. This, the reason why I, I am very much concerned about this area because it was just recent that um, oh, this day, this month alone, we've been hearing killings, stealings, breaking of public places in this country, and yet still. Um, I will urge, I, 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 I will not say the government is not doing nothing about it, or the security forces are not doing it, but I will urge them to take drastic action against the culprits of this particular act. It's, as I am sitting here today, I received an information from Sanchez Badad. Two youths kill a 20-year-old boy. Today, when I'm, you know, as I am sitting on this chair, this issue is alarming in this country. Honorable Vice President, I will urge you, together with your cabinet, to come up with laws that can, of course, reduce this menace in our country. Otherwise, if things get out of hand, I don't know where I know we will be. No country can move without security. Security is paramount. The reason why all of us are here, because the area is secure. This is why we are here in peace. But if blessed are flying all over, you think we'll be here? No way. So I'll urge the government to, of course, um, look at this issue critically, so that at least um, what we are known for, we can maintain the same, um, the same standard. Because um, people used to say Gambia is more, Gambia is a peaceful country within the sub-region. But they said within the space of two weeks, Gambia is the only country in the sub-region which registered the highest rate of crime within two weeks, fortnight. That means what we are known for is now disappearing or banishing from us. Honestly, sometimes, you know, it's just hard to say. But um, Gambians, we need to take the responsibility of our country and do what is right for the people of this country. On the issue of education, I would want to say, of course, we might have structures might be there. But do we have enough materials in our school systems? I was a teacher before here. I taught for some years, and of course, I'm finally venture into business. You know, body bunkers. Um, I would want to say um, we need buildings, or need, we need structures in our school. That's true. But we also need quality teachers. We need qualified teachers. Most expensive, most expensive schools that are, of course, over there, up country. Only good teachers have, have been attracted to schools here, especially private schools. With the proliferation of these private schools, I think private schools are killing our public schools. And most of us don't have an opportunity to send our kids to these private schools. This is why the results are always different. Of course, if I have the means of sending my kids to private schools, that's what I do, because I need better education for my kids. But I don't have the means. I mean, somebody, say, in the village, doesn't have the means to do that. This is why government, especially the Ministry of Education, honestly, they did not know, know teachers in private schools. They are forced to teach. You teach or you leave. That is not happening in our public schools. I'm sorry, but this is the fact. I experienced it. Before here, I headed a private school at Talindi. He's my living witness. 
We put in mechanisms, in, we organize ourselves in such a way that no, if we employ you, you are not prepared to, of course, take out the work that you, you, you said you're going to do. We give you the marching order. This is why that school always, we, our results are always good. And all I know 98% of the private schools are like that. Why not public schools? And this was not, the, the, this was not happening before. In the First Republic, public schools were doing well. And the first 10 years of the Second Republic also. But now, you will see a student who has graduated from grade 12, to construct a good sentence he or she would, would not be able to do. This is serious. This is serious. I think what we should do is, uh, I'm not saying we should do private schools, but I think we should also try and pay great attention to our public schools, because these are the schools in which most Gambians or most government children are attending, because most of us are from poor families. If I cannot afford to pay $5,000 for one time for my child, of course, no, I'll send my child to, to, to a public school. And most governments are, this is what we are doing. But it is the responsibility of the Ministry of Education to correct that system. No wonder we saw mass failure in the recent concluded was examination. And I fear the same thing might happen you know, in Gabesi as well. There are a lot of combination of factors which we as Gambians need to sit and of course solve those factors in order to have a, a better educational system in, 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 our, in our country. I rest my case here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member, for lively now I give the floor to the member for Jimara. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I stand on all the pro pro existing protocols. I want to recognize the presence of the Vice President the cabinet ministers, honorable members, members of the press, <clears throat> and of course, members of the general public that are watching the, this particular debate from the Gambia and at large. Honorable speaker, I want to thank, take this opportunity to thank the, the, the government of the Republic of the Gambia. <clears throat> and to thank the President of the Republic, His Excellency, President Adam Abaro, for fulfilling his constitutional mandate. It is stated in the section, in the section of the Constitution, that is section 77 of the Constitution, subsection one, that the President shall at least once in a year attend sittings of the National Assembly to address a session on the conditions of the government. This before us today that we have is a speech delivered by the President of the Republic of the Gambia, His Excellency President Arama Baro, GMRG. As a result, today we are here to debate the content of the speech. Mr. Speaker, if you look at the content of this content of the table, you see that the press, His Excellency, the President of the Republic of the Gambia, has highlighted a lot of things to this uh, August Assembly. <clears throat> about 22 or 23 points or thematic areas that he has come up with 
to, to tell us as honorable members, showing us the condition of the, of, of, of the country and also the development projects and policies that the executive has in place. I must say I am, I am very proud to be here today to participate in the debate. And I'm very proud of the government for the tremendous efforts and tremendous achievements that they've registered uh, during the period under review. Uh, Honorable Speaker, <coughs> even the Badibungas today, they acknowledge that the, it is true that His Excellency and his cabinet members had really done a lot for this country. This is very rare. It is not, it is not the, uh, very easy for Badibungas to acknowledge somebody's effort. But today, we say very thank you and bravo to the, to, 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 to the president and his team. Uh, I must say I'm kind of speechless because honorable member for Badibu Central or Central Badibu has already touched all the areas that I've highlighted that I wanted to talk about. At some point, I even wanted to withdraw my request to speak or to take a platform today to, to speak with the people. But there are certain only two areas that has not been discussed by him. I want to touch those areas and, and uh, make my point on those. <clears throat> Honorable Speaker, if you look at the President's introductory, uh, introductory remark, The introductory, uh, introductory remark you have, point three, where he has talked about Gambia has been a, transport, a transformed nation. This part has been dealt with almost two or three members of the National Assembly express, expressing their opinion how they think a transformed nation should look like. But I want to take a different dimension. <clears throat> because here in this parliament, we are dealing with English. And English is a language that is very tricky sometimes. <clears throat> in English, some words, they drive their meanings, their original meaning, meanings, depending on the context that they are put. So based on my, based on my understanding, honorable speaker, I for one, I believe that Gambia is transforming. If not a transformed nation, but it is transforming. As opposed to <clears throat> what has been said about Gambia not being a transformed nation. Honorable Speaker, during the past 22 years or past 26, seven years, Gambia and Gambians we are in a cage. Today, we enjoy democracy, rule of law, justice, freedom of speech and freedom of expression. Yet, we say Gambia is not a transformed nation. 22 years ago, 27 years ago, Mr. Speaker, Honorable Speaker, This particular assembly used to be I concur, I concur, I concur, National Assembly of the Republic of the Gambia. <clears throat> but today the National Assembly reflects the aspirations and the hope and serve as a beacon of hope for the people of the Gambia. This is simply because the enabling environment has been created by the government, by His Excellency and his executive uh, members, 
so that everybody can participate or exercise your political, you know, your, your, your constitutional right. Honorable Speaker, 22 years ago, because we cannot bring out the realities to make our point very valid if we do not do some comparison. Some 22 or 27 years ago, it was almost impossible for an individual to win a case against the sitting president. Today, we see, we have seen in some cases where our president loses cases against individuals, government loses cases against individuals, yet we say Gambia is not a transformed nation, as opposed to uh, 22 years ago, where the executive makes sure that nobody challenges the executive. So I don't intend to spend much of, your, uh, much of my time today because uh, I've made to understand most of the points that I have today, I can address them during our adjournment debate. So on that note, I will not take much of your time. Uh, Honorable Speaker, I want to look at security. Great achievements by the security sector. A lot of trainings, policies, policies are being implemented or being, you know, been made. But my problem with the security sector, especially where I am from, URR, that is Upper River Region. I had the opportunity to work with the security fraternity in Upper River Region for the past two years. Honorable Speaker, it will surprise you the way and manner these people are living in that particular area. <clears throat> we don't talk about accommodation. Accommodation is a, is a problem as far as the securities are concerned in Upper River Region. Looking at the nature of our of, of URR, it has bordered with three parts of the Senegalese borders and we have only two or three official entry points. In addition, we have more than 50 unofficial entry points. As we all know, the role of a security is to protect life and properties of the people. But also, security can contribute in the health sector as well. Where I came from, URR, the borders are very porous and the securities are finding it very difficult to patrol the area. As a result, people are coming in with a lot of medicines that we term as counterfeit medicines, selling them to our mothers, our sisters, our brothers, that is causing a lot of diseases that are unidentified. I want to urge the, minist the Ministry of Interior to look into the affairs of the securities, security personnel as far as URL is concerned, because there is where I know at least to look at their, 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 their welfare, there are mobility issues. A lot of members talk about mobility. Mobility is a crisis in this country. Wherever you go, you have a problem of mobility. But I'm telling you, the security cannot perform effectively and efficiently if they don't have mobility to patrol around our borders. You just cross the borders, you see Senegalese, the Zandarmeri, the forest guards, well equipped, have their mobility, and they are, they are patrolling anyhow. That's why it is very difficult for you to escape 
even we take a cup of sugar into Senegalese, into, the, into customers. But it's a problem in the Gambia. I could recall two years ago, <coughs> Senegalese forces, sorry, uh, there are forest guards, enter into the soil of, of, of the Gambia in pursuance of somebody who was, who did, did the accuse of transporting timber from the bush to, to, to our, our soil. They even opened fire in the community that I held called Gambisar. This couldn't have happened if we had the police or the army or other security apparatus patrolling that, <coughs> that, that, that border, border line. Yes, we understand Gambia has a bilateral relationship with Senegal. They have agreements. I think in this National Assembly, something was passed that is called, that is called hot pursuit. But this hot pursuit, the content is not known to the general public. This, host pursuit, uh, this host, uh, hot pursuit is something that I think the Senegalese are misusing. This is something that I urge the Ministry of Interior or Defense. I don't know under which uh, one of them it falls. To carefully look at. Because it's one day or the other is going to cause a, a problem between these two countries. Gone are days when people will, scared, will be scared of armed robbers or even, or, or even officers. Before you have members of the national, uh, members of the general public being trampled up, upon by armed robbers that, trans, that, that came from this, uh, the Kazama's end. <coughs> but today we have our cutlasses, our axes, even our guns in our houses. it is not going to be a business as usual. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to address an issue. But that has already been addressed, as the Speaker has said. We want to avoid repetition of each other's uh, speeches and also in the interest of time, we allow others to, to take the baton and, and do their deliberation. <clears throat> but before I take my seat, Mr. 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 Honorable Speaker, I want to concur with Honorable Sabah Sanja and Honorable Fonyi Perfect <clears throat> on their deliberation according to them. Gambia, we have a, an attitudinal problem. This attitudinal problem is cross-cutting. It's across the board. From the executive, to directors, to national assembly members, to the general public. It is only in this country, Mr. Speaker, you see civil servants that are appointed and being, being paid with taxpayers' money to take care of the needs and the, and the welfare of the people appointed by the executive. And they are not, in, not doing anything in the offices other than food dragging and undermining each other. Honorable Speaker, I have a fear. looking at the nature of the, uh, of the laws that we have in the 1997 Constitution. <clears throat> Maybe by next session we will be having the Constitutional Review Commission, their report, their recommendation on this, on this, on this table here. Looking at the level of politics, self-centered, self-interest, selfishness that we have, among members. <clears throat> there is a fear 
that we may one day or the other fail the nation and also the people of uh, the general public that sent us in this house. The President has said it in his concluding remark. I want to refer you, uh, uh, refer you to page uh, 53. Yes, page, page 53. Is it 53? Just give me a second. Okay, page 63, bullet point 14, right? No, 15. <laughs> bullet point 15, no paragraph 15. Thank you, Honorable Member, for, for, for that. Uh, it states, <clears throat> in whatever you do, let the interests of the nation come first. To deliver, it is imperative that you walk along bipartisan line. As alluded to the president, and emphasized by some of the members that took the baton yesterday. He said to fulfill the, to fulfill the people's aspirations and safeguard the honor of those who choose you to represent them. We should work on bipartisan life. But Mr. Speaker, Honorable Speaker, the reality on the ground is far from this thing that the President is advising us to do. And I want to urge all members to take this thing seriously. Yes, we may be here on political tickets, but we are here to represent the people of the Gambia, especially the electorates that sent us here. We need to behave, uphold the core values of the National Assembly as honorable members. <laughs> the title honorable member does not come from the blue, just like that. Honorable Sabah Sanjal, Honorable Jane Sanja. It is the trust and the confidence that is being bestowed on you by the layman or by the vulnerable people or by the poor people of the Gambia to come to, the house, to, come to this house and speak on their behalf. Behave as a honorable person. Listen on their behalf and make sure so you legislate good laws for the country and for the betterment of the people. But with the interests, the personal interests we started to see, the political interests that we started to display, we are about to fail our people, and this is something that I think is not honorable as honorable members. On that note, Honorable Speaker, as promised, I don't want to spend much of the time. I want to take the opportunity to thank, to thank the people of Jimara constituency. For the past 52 years, Jimara has been neglected. But these are things that we can discuss at plenary, and they were underrepresented. I want to seize the opportunity to thank, to thank them for sending us here on their behalf to speak on their behalf and also to represent as a honorable member on behalf of Jima. On that note, I beg to take my seat. Honorable. Thank you, honorable member, for your generosity.
in your time management. I, you know, when you started, I thought you wouldn't speak for more than five minutes. But anyway, thank you. And those comments will be more generous than you. I hope so. Now I call on the member for Sani Mentring. Thank you for giving me the floor, honorable speaker. First, I have to acknowledge the presence of the Vice President of the Republic of the Gambia for being with us since yesterday on behalf of the President of this nation. And also thank the honorable ministers for fulfilling their constitutional mandate for also being with us here since yesterday. And which I was about to say, the way they are seated wasn't gender balanced. But fortunately, Honorable Minister for Gender, Children and Social Welfare is, is with us. And on that we have, um, I have to thank, give a special thanks to her. She is a woman and she is the only woman in the parliament with us since the first day. First, um, I'll start with the Honorable Speaker. I'll start with regards to the land issues. Honorable Speaker, to be specific, and in order to gain time, Salaji, we all know, was part of Sukuta. And this is exactly the community that I belong to. Salaji, there was a time during Two months, a month and a half ago, that the market has been demolished, owned by women, I guess, and there was chaos in that particular market that women, so many malpractices have been done on women by throwing tear gases, as we call it, to them in order to demolish the market and then to send them away. I guess this is not fair to the women of this nation. And Honorable Speaker, on that note, I hereby ask the Honorable Minister for Local Government and Lands, where or do they have any place that they will allocate for women of that particular area for them to do their normal businesses and take care of their family and support their husbands at home? Honorable Speaker, I suggest to the Honorable Minister of Lands or the physical planning to engage people whose place needs to be demolished if there is need, to engage them on dialogue to solve problems or to prevent violence. What violence cannot solve, I think chaos cannot solve that. Honorable Speaker, in the same Salaji, a man whom paramilitaries has thrown a tear gas to him right on in his ear that his ear was broken and he, went, he was taken to the Serekunda hospital for treatment and nothing absolutely has been done up to date. I think, as I said earlier, dialogue should have been the best practice in order to maintain peace. Honorable Speaker, Lands has been claimed by people who doesn't even know how it was inherited, and yet the Minister of Lands or the Physical Planning will give those people the lands that does not belong to them. And I have evidences of those lands, those particular lands, and Point which I guess... Order, Point of order, please. Point of order. Yes, can we hear your point of order, number four, Lower Salu? Yeah, thank you, Honorable Speaker. Um, close um, 29th of the standing order. 29 years. Content of the speech. Every member shall restrict his or her observation on the subjects under discussion. I guess um, the, the member for Salamon Tank is deviated. Yes. Um, thank you, Honorable Member. As I indicated earlier on, the President's statement 
uh, touches on all sectors. So, uh, however, I will advise the honourable member that we concentrate on the president's statement for speed of time. Thank you, honourable member. You may continue. Thank you very much, honourable speaker. But I think this is about constitution, cons constituencies matters, and a nation without the combination of these constituencies, there will not be a country. And basically, I think these problems are affecting various constituencies, not only signing mentoring, but other constituencies. But nevertheless, thank you very much, and I will proceed. Honorable Speaker, with the issues of victims, the victims of April 10th and 11th, and also the victims of July 22nd. Honorable Speaker, these are our own sisters and brothers, aunts, daughters, and sons. I think um, there was a time that 50, 000, 50 million dollars was reparated among these victims, and yet some are still complaining that they don't even have a place to live, or some have not benefited from this medical treatment. And, Honorable Speaker, I am appealing to the line ministry to look into that properly. These are people who deserve a good health and a good living. Honorable Speaker, with the issue of women gardening countrywide, basically in sanitary constituency. Honorable Speaker, we've all heard from the President of the Gambia that women, during his campaign, that women will no more use the well and ropes to wet water their gardens, but instead they will use the internet services, but instead they even lack water. Honorable Speaker, through this sauna that the President has submitted or have presented to this August Assembly, presenting that women much is settled in the sector, in women's sector, I am appealing to the President to look into that properly to support women in their gardens with the respective ministry. Honorable Speaker, The remain of solo sanding. Yes, I know the issue has been going to court, but please, the remain of solo sanding has to be given to the family, at least to, for a proper burial. Honorable <coughs> Speaker, with the issue of the PIU, um, that is the security sector, even on our nomination day at West Coast Region, we were attacked by the PIU, seriously. And still, nothing has been done. I think the line ministry has to come up with something that this must stop in the Gambia for people to be maltreated, even on their nomination day. And these are our own sisters, these are citizens of the Gambia, these are our own brothers, these are our own mothers who were affected seriously, and nothing has been said up to date. Honorable Speaker, with regards to the road connectivity, yes, there is this OIC project on which my constituency is benefiting. The road connectivity from Burford Gamtel to, to um, uh, through Ghana Town, and also from Ghana Town to Madiana, and also from um, Haidarakunda Junction to Tintinto is on a very serious condition. Honorable Speaker, I would urge the line ministry that some houses were demolished already and there was no compensation, and I am urging to the line ministry for compensations to be given to those affected in order to have a very good living, which they deserve. And also to look at the timing <coughs> the timeline properly so that it will not go beyond the time because actually um, roads are in very bad conditions, especially just this rainy season. Honorable Speaker, also on the area of the maternal mortality, yes, some 
of the honorable members have already spoken on that area. And I thank the honorable member for benefit, honorable Amikoli, for elaborating on the conditions that women will be during labor in the Gambia. Honorable Speaker, I definitely urge to the Honorable Minister of Health to look into this properly. Women are dying day in, day out. I don't know what measures can be taken to make sure that this can be reduced. I know we cannot stop it because of nature, but this can be reduced. This is the problem of women in the Gambia now, much more especially when a woman is pregnant, the husband will not spend sleep, sleep at all times. Honorable Speaker, let the Minister of Finance also consider, yes, there are taxes here and there, taxes and policies, but I urge to the Minister of Finance to come up with a bill or a policy that a tax expenditure policy can also be introduced in the Gambia. Because when there are taxes, also the expenditure should also come up as a policy. <coughs> Honorable Speaker, there are challenges that national development plan should address, and some of which are the political sphere, the social sphere, and the economist. Honorable Speaker, there is extreme law of local representation of women at all levels. Also, there is lack of affirmative action, inadequate enforcement, implementation, and monitoring of laws and policies. Honorable Speaker, social norms and values also needs is a challenge, rather. On economics, law inadequate and rigorous access to finance is absolute lack of access and ownership of lands for women, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, disasters, disaster occur, especially during the rainy season, that is the flood, and also the fire breakage. Honorable Speaker, one of the honorable members had already spoken about that, and I don't need to go over that again, not to repeat, but then just to concur with him that we need to solve these problems prior, or we need to put things in consideration in terms of flood prior to rainy season. We should not only wait when it is rainy season and there is flood and we want to remedy the situation. Honorable Speaker, I want the line ministry to be looking at that properly and then also to be supporting those affected on time. Let them not wait until when they will not have food for their families. They will not be able to pay school fees for their children or when they will not be able to support their husbands at home. That will be the only time after when they will be ready to support that person. Honorable Speaker, with the issue of our girls' children in Arabic schools, yes, there is support for girl children in Arabic schools, or for, for schools. But I would like the Minister of Local Government and Lands and Regional Affairs to collaborate with the Minister of Education to, sub, to give special support to girl children in Arabic schools, because in most of the times, yes, there are teachers who graduated from Arabic schools, and they are teaching in various schools. But also, this can be an additional support still to girl children in Arabic schools because, to my own observation, that most of the time, when these girl children graduated from Arabic schools, few things that they can always do is just to go and get married, or they will teach 
in various schools. Nothing more will be done for them as a minister or ambassadors or so. Honorable Minister, with the issue of transport, works, and infra infrastructure, Honorable Minister, we've all seen um, a company who supported the government, I will per se, by giving the Gambia some buses. Honorable Speaker, I expect the transport, works, and infrastructure to explain to the general public how those buses came into the Gambia and where are they on loan basis and how much is spent and what it will be the term of payment. We trade industry, regional integration and employment, Honorable Speaker. There is a protocol with TSRP protocol. This protocol has not been respected by our neighboring country, Senegal, and which I expect the trade, industry, regional integration and employment to sit with them and discuss seriously to make sure that this protocol is respected in our country and beyond. Also, when you're traveling out of this country to a neighboring country, either Senegal or Guinea-Bissau, there is this high charges of savers, mil francs, any station you go. I don't think this is fair to the people of this Gambia. ECOWAS had an agreement. There is an agreement already. If you are a citizen of an ECOWAS country, you don't need to pay anything to enter Senegal or to Guinea-Bissau. Yet there are charges all over, and I think the ministry has to look into this properly to collaborate with them to make sure that this stops, because this is not taking us any further. Honorable Speaker, with the issue of fisheries, water resources, and National Assembly matters, fisheries, basically, Honorable Speaker, we've all seen that there are Chinese, Senegalese, and people from other areas, from other states, coming into our country, getting our fish, taking it to their country, or selling them on a very higher rate. Honorable Speaker, this brought her to the high rate or to the high price of the fish that most people cannot afford in the Gambia. Honorable Speaker, I urge to the Minister of Fisheries to look into this properly so that fish can be affordable. Honorable Speaker, I thank you very much and I will stop here because most of the points have been already talked about with the other honorable members. In order to gain time, I will take my seat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Member, for Shani Mentering. I now invite the Honorable Nominated Member, Keba Alam Kamara. Keba Alam Pofana, rather. Honorable Member, I apologize. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. <clears throat> and uh, no need for the apology. It's OK. Thank you. Uh, once again, I will start by saying thank you, Honorable Speaker. And uh, I would uh, acknowledge uh, and thank the Vice President for his presence with us here since yesterday. And as well, uh, acknowledge the presence of all the Honorable Ministers who have been with us since yesterday. And uh, before commencing, I would uh, like to specially thank the President for fulfilling his uh, constitutional mandate. Honorable Speaker, we are here to analyze, debate, and give our suggestions on the State of the Nation Address, which, by its standing, is supposed to tell us the state of affairs of the country as at a particular period. And uh, of course, the report is coming in 2022, <clears throat> but the particular report under review is for the year, the year that ended 2021. So, Honorable Speaker, Without wasting much time, I would start my deliberations with the Ministry of Finance. And uh, with my deliberations, I just want to start with uh, a little clarification or 
would I say to highlight some of the strategies which the government was implementing during the post-COVID period, because this was concern, this, this is a concern that has been raised by many members. And to do justice to that, I would like to refer the House to page 7 of the report under paragraph 3. <clears throat> I will read the entire paragraph and then highlight my area of concentration. It reads, Revenue collection for the first two months of 2022 declined by 14% against the same period in 2021. Prompted by this development, the government resolved to formulate robust policies that will set up buffers against such an enhanced domestic resource mobilization. Honorable Speaker, I would like to deliberate on the sound economic recovery strategy which the government formulated by emulating or embracing policies and principles that will strengthen the domestic resource mobilization prowess of this country. Honorable Speaker, when we say domestic resource mobilization, we mean ways and, measure, ways and means in which countries generate their own local funds to spend towards their own developments. If you look at the current report, you realize that the total debt payment of the government stands at 5.01 billion. Out of this 5.01 billion, 1.9 billion comes from external lending, and 3.9 billion is from what? Domestic borrowing. Which means the government is confronted with what? Inadequate resources. So what is the government trying to do now? The government is saying, look, we are not saying that we would not borrow, but we want to enhance what we can collect locally. If we support the government in this strategy, it will yield so many dividends. One of which is domestic resource mobilization is the most reliable source of public funding. It's the most reliable source of what? Public funding. Because it is in your hands. You are not relying on what? Developmental partners. You are not relying on what? Donor agencies. You are not relying on what? Grants. And at the end of the day as well, you would not pay any interest on it. And at the end of the day as well, you are at liberty to prioritize where to what? Inject your own funds. So which means, let's imagine of the ideal situation whereby this strategy works for the government and we have adequate resources which will warrant the government not to go for any borrowing. And let's assume this was achieved in 2021, which means an, our external debt payment of 5.01 would have been ready, readily available, would have been readily available to be injected into other priority areas of what? The economy. But it doesn't stop there as well. Let's concentrate on the value that was sourced from domestic borrowing, which stood at 3.1 billion. That 3.1 billion is money that government borrowed locally from the commercial banks. What happens in that situation? It means the government is competing with the private what? Businesses over the little resources which are available. So imagine the ideal situation where we support the government in its domestic resource mobilization efforts. And we are able to what? Raise. Are you observing or you? Go ahead. Don't worry. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. You are talking about the 1.9 uh, for the external borrowing and the, and the 3.1. It's not the borrowing, it's the service payment. That is the part of the service payment. Can, can I continue? Yeah. Hon Honorable Member, can you use the microphone? You did not get it. He was talking about the 1.9. 
uh, which is for external borrowing. According to him, that is borrowed. And then the 3.1 is also borrowed domestically. So I'm saying not, it's not being the borrowing, it is the service payment that this is referring to. It's referring to the payment, not I, the borrowing. I, are you ready? Can I continue? Yes, you can. Uh, honorable member, I just want to remind you that you will never pay if you don't borrow. Not so. Why are they paying? Why are they paying those debts? It's because they've borrowed them. The payment is over a period of time. They are not paying it in a lump sum. They'll pay it over 15 based on what? The contractual agreement. So I think I am on point, but thank you for enhancing my deliberations. So, Honorable Speaker, as I was saying, let's imagine of the ideal situation where the country's domestic resource mobilization efforts are enhanced and we are able to raise our own funds and we reach to the state that we will not depend on external funds okay. either to borrow okay. or them coming as grants or what loans. Observation, Honorable Member. I, I would like to continue this time. Let's save it for the future. This is very important, please. Is it on the point or outside? Of course, on, on that point. Thank you. Continue. You, uh, you want to convince the National Assembly to help government on its uh, local resource mobilization by way of uh, local lending. And this has uh, fatal consequences. You, you've made the points. Can you take your seat? Take your no, seat. I got your point. This is what you were talking about. Sorry, sit down. Sit down. You've, you've missed you. the point. Sit down. Sit down. Kindly, Kindly sit down. You've, you've missed the point. I'm not convincing the National Assembly to help the government in their local borrowing efforts. In fact, on the contrary, I'm telling the National Assembly to applaud the efforts of the government by what? Kick-starting a domestic resource mobilization policy, which means to be self-reliant, okay? The government is saying now we want to be self-reliant. So what I'm trying to do now here is to tell you what we stand to benefit as a people, to tell you the savings we can do, to tell you the additional resources we can have, which we will be in a position to redirect into what our priority areas. Okay? So I will continue, Honorable Speaker. What I was saying, the point I was at is, if at all we are able to improve on our efforts of domestic resource mobilization, the government will not find itself in a position whereby they'll be lending from the commercial banks, which means the, there'll be too much money, the private banks will have too much money at their disposals, interest rates will come down, funds will be available for the promotion of what small and medium-sized enterprises. This will what? Yield into greater employment what? Opportunities. And uh, honorable speaker, Having said this, it means the government is on track. It means the policies are good. But I must observe, sound policies must be accompanied by what efficient and productive monitoring mechanisms. I am one of the people who have the fervent belief that if we can harness our potentials which are readily available in the domestic resource mobilization. Perhaps the situation might not only be that we would not need to borrow, but we might not even operate at a budget deficit. Honorable Speaker, the government can create the great policies. They can have the great ideas. But at the end of the day, we are the people who are going to work there. The domestic resource mobilization will come from the taxes from the duties, from the custom excess. When you look at the collection process, the mechanism must be accompanied by an efficient control mechanism. Today, if you look at all the collection processes we have in this country, we can easily say that 90% of it involves human interface. And with that human interface, it comes with inherent risks of what? Leakages. So my point of observation here would be, I would urge the government to speed up the digitization program. I would urge the government
to make sure that we do everything in our ability to limit the human interface, most of when it comes to the collection of what? Public funds. By doing so, we'll be able to account for the funds in totality. And once we have these funds in totality, then we'll be in a better position to what? Invest in our priority areas and also address the needs of what? Our people. And again, Honorable Speaker, another strategy I would uh, definitely like to highlight with regards to the way the government have been operating as highlighted by the report of the President in the post-COVID period is the public management reforms, which we would have on page nine. And with the public management reforms, basically what the government is trying to do there is come up with strategies which would definitely make sure that public funds are what operated in an accountable and trans transparent environment. And special emphasis in the report was paid to the local government authorities. Honorable Speaker, this is very, very important. Many a times you talk about the decentralization policy. And when you talk about the decentralization policy, we are starting it from the communal level. That is the ward level, that, that is the village level, to the ward level, to the regional level. And at the regional level, you have the local government authorities. I don't want to bring specific examples. I just wanted to really limit my contribution to the merits of the report. But if you would permit me, I would just take this one exception. When I came into this National Assembly, during our orientation meeting, our experienced members, including the honorable member for Opasalu, one of the questions or the concerns the FPAP committee had with the local government authorities was, you are always demanding for more money, but you are not totally accounting for what is being given to you. Which means the public finance mechanism have come at a very right time. Because today, the local government authorities have their autonomy. They are collecting what? Revenue. How much are they collecting? What system do they have? What are the mechanisms for verification? And whatever funds they collect, added to whatever funds the central government is collecting, Cumulatively, that forms the total available funds which the government of the Gambia can use with regards to what? Our infrastructural development, investments in the health sector, education, environment, you name it. So if at all currently the Ministry of Finance have adopted the public finance management strategy to really, and I would quote, from the book this time, because this one is important, it says to address weaknesses in the public finance management of local government authorities. And to be specific, these weaknesses might not only be limited to clerical errors. These weaknesses might go further and culminate into what? Leakages. And every leakage is depriving the government of the opportunity to invest in what? The social needs of the citizens. So, Honorable Speaker, I think at this point, what we need to do as a National Assembly, because everything cannot go to the government, we have oversight responsibilities in all these line ministries. If you look at the constitution of the Gambia, of course, we all agree that there are some laws which need to be changed. But believe in me, there are very good laws there. But many a times we make laws, but we do not enforce them. Today, with the domestic resource mobilization, the government will be in a position to collect so much revenue. There comes the responsibility of the National Assembly. And in that, I want to highlight one weakness, which we need to improve on as an institution. 
many a times emphasis is laid on controls with regards to the expenditures. Because we say we approve the budget, we want to know how the government is spending it. But what we forget to know also is, the money the government is taking to fund those ones, part of it is coming from the local funds. And those local funds are collected by state agents. And not for once have we engaged in the audits of revenue. So I will urge this assembly, if at all it is a legislative gap, let us what? Make sure we come out with the necessary legal instruments which will ensure that the emphasis we are placing on the auditing of the expenses, the same emphasis are laid on the auditing of what? The revenue. A classical point in hand is this. And if I'm wrong, someone can correct me from the floor. I believe that this country doesn't have a problem of expenditure. The Minister of Finance was able to what? Cut over 1.3 billion from the approved budget of 2021, of 2022 rather. As for the revised budget that was presented to this August House for approval during our sitting up in the month of July. But during the same period when they reported, we realized that there was a reduction in revenue of how much? Almost 3.3 billion. Which means our greatest problem is in what? The revenue aspect. We were able to reduce our expenses, but we were not able to add a single dollar on the revenue. And as a result of that, instead of the deficit going down from two point something million, it rose up to almost what? Five billion. So which means we have to pay greater emphasis on the revenue as well. The mechanisms are great. I applaud the Minister of Finance. It is a great initiative. It will give us economic independence, but the road to its attainment, it's not going to be easy. The road to its attainment requires what? Selfishness. It requires being principled, and it requires that the control mechanisms have to be effective, and the National Assembly also must play its point. Honorable Speaker, at this juncture, I would just want to conclude on the issue of the financial ministry with a little contribution on uh, the public-private partnership initiative that the government is coming with. The government cannot do it alone. Haven't realized that. Today, if you go to many countries, it is through government's partnership with the private sector that they've been able to develop, that they've been able to move ahead. And I would like to say this, that the National Assembly would not hesitate to give the government the required support it required to really make sure that that particular bill, when presented to the Assembly, is given the needful that it requires. Honorable Speaker, at this juncture, I would move to the Ministry of Agriculture. We should be on page 12. In the Ministry of Agriculture, it is uh, in accordance with the report of the President, it is remarkable to note that there have been significant improvements in crop production. There have been significant improvements in the poultry production as well. But many of these can be attributed to the previous year, because if you look at the Shona report of 2021, you will realize that the agricultural ministry did make distributions of dozens of tractors. Seeds were given to farmers. So it means, with the right investment, we can have improved results. But, Honorable Speaker, in the report, I was hoping to see the value addition. I was also hoping to see 
what the ministry would be doing with regards to the needs of the farmers in terms of market analysis and development. There was an increment in crop production. That increment in crop production can only bring something of substantial value to the farmer if at all the post-harvest losses are what reduced and reduced significantly. So I would definitely like to urge the agricultural ministry to say that the investments in agriculture are really significant and it is refreshing to know that great results are coming. So now let us move to the next stage. How do we add value to the vegetables that our mothers, our sisters are really producing from the agricultural farms? How do we make sure that the mangoes that have been planted into this country are transformed into something else before sending them as raw materials out of this country or allowing them to be perishable goods? How do we make sure that our small farmers also, we expose them to what other markets whereby they will have what opportunities which will add value to what they are having? You know? And uh, the other observation I made was that it is reported that over 6,000 hectares of rice was cultivated. But this is significant. But what is the benchmark? How does this help towards our drive of food self-sufficiency? This would have helped. So that as a National Assembly, we would also be in a position to know the gaps. We will also be in a position to know where government needs our help the most so that we can give them. So I would urge the ministry to include benchmarks in the reporting so that moving forward, when we receive the statistics, we will not be in a limbo towards their what interpretation. But having said that, I believe with the report that is being received from the president, the agricultural ministry is moving forward. The agricultural ministry is really improving. And we are confident that with the current leadership, is it on the point? Now, if it is something, if it is on this point, I would allow you. But if it is something, kindly allow me to go. On the point I'm discussing. OK, you may go. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you look at in the report in agriculture, because this is a very important sector for the country, because it is said that 70% of the population depend on agriculture. And then it is our farmers who are definitely crying today. Anyway, can, all can, can you observe me and yes, then make a statement? I want to observe, because they just mentioned the increase in production. But by what percentage, we don't know. It's not there. Thank you. You, you may take your seat. That's exactly what I'm saying. I said we need benchmarks. I said we need to know those 6,000 hectares of rice, how does it help us towards attaining our vision of what food self-sufficiency? So just thank you for enriching my point of debate. So uh, to conclude on the area of agriculture, I would urge the minister to definitely provide us with the relevant statistics so that we'll be in, a, in an informed position to complement government's efforts in making sure that that particular ministry is given the due that it requires. A lot have been said about the ministry, which I wouldn't dwell on. Some of them might not be pleasant, but these are the living realities. And we are all part and parcel of this society. So which means we all know better. But when it comes to capacity, the ministry have it. So we are really confident that now they would definitely deliver. Honorable Speaker, on that note, I will move on to education, and I would like to combine both. That is both the basic and secondary education together with the higher education research and water technology. It is quite refreshing to know the significant improvements or achievements that were registered during the past five years. Key among them is the transformation of both GTTI and MDI. Key among them would be the construction of numerous 
schools and the provision of enough classrooms to what? Students. Key among them as well would be the laying of the foundation stone of the new complex of the university that will be housed in Birkam. Honorable Speaker, I'm a runaway teacher. They call us rats. I was teaching for five years at senior secondary level. So when it comes to the teaching environment, it's not only about the classrooms. The education system needs to start from the homes, coming to the society, down to the schools. At the schools, what I would urge the ministry is to see what we can do to retain Gambian teachers. Because the school I was teaching, the year I left, I think almost all the Gambian teachers left together, over five of us. And successively, in successive years, the performance of that school was really going down. Why am I saying, let's improve and see how do we maintain Gambian teachers in school? Honorable Speaker, this country belongs to us. No one will come and improve it for us. No one will come and develop this country for us. A Gambian will be ashamed to call himself a teacher without the required qualifications. Because everybody knows you in the society. This is your country. You will do your best for it. I'm not saying that the foreign teachers do not come with qualifications. But, Honorable Speaker, I know for sure that many of them do not have the qualifications. And they are in the system. The other thing also will be the curriculum. <coughs> Honorable Speaker, Many a times, you would see an individual from grade 1 to grade 12, he will finish school, he wouldn't have the opportunity to further his education, and they will call him a dropout. After 12 years of education, he cannot call himself a professional in any field because he was not exposed to it. And many a times, these are the individuals who will be what? Graduating from the adolescent stage to what? Maturehood. Ages between 17, 18, 19, thereabout. With that transformation in your social belonging and having standing there alone to face the realities of life, after devoting your life, your time, your energy to a particular course for 12 years, because you are less fortunate, you are coming from a poor background, you do not have the financial muscle to further your education, you can't move on, and you are called a dropout without a skill. Why? And society will brand you as a failure. You are not a failure. We are all gifted in one way or the other. So when I say enhancing that curriculum, let us make it career-based. Let us expose the youth to entrepreneurship. Let us expose them to leadership courses at a very, very young age. So that we would have the guarantee that anybody who passes through that 12 years mandatory period of education will be able to humbly or efficiently engage himself into something. Honorable Speaker, again on education. If you go to social media, they will tell you the education ministry have failed us. They will tell you the government is not doing anything. But today, we have more schools. Today, we have better structures. Let us ask ourselves why. I think being a parent would qualify me to say this. Every student comes from a home. There is no more corporal punishment. But one thing I know is, in life, wherever there is the balance of reward and punishment do not exist, do not think about the possibility of having the results you wish. I'm not saying punish the students. But one must know and believe in the guarantee that if you do good, there'll be a reward. And if you do bad, there'll be a punishment. Collectively, let us look at these reforms. Is it giving us the results we want? 
Reforms have to be progressive. But today, you cannot even look at a student in his eye. Today, you dare not shout on a student. If you do, tomorrow the mother or the father will accompany the student to the school. Today, every student in the middle school or in the high school is having a mobile. You are either on Facebook or in TikTok. The teachers are not buying those mobiles for you. Who is giving it to you? It's the home. As parents, we have a role to play. Society has a role to play. What the state can do is to provide the enabling environment. What the state can do is to provide the policies, the programs, and the initiatives. But to conclude on the area of education, I strongly believe that a lot has to be done. at the level of the home, at the level of society, and at the level of government as well. And if government can transform that curriculum into something that will yield dividend for that person who passes through the 12 years of mandatory education, that would take us a long way towards reducing the unemployment, towards reducing the crime rates, and towards reducing a lot of the social disparities that we are confronted with today as a society. As, as, as a member, I'm not allowed to take questions. You can only contribute to what I'm saying. You want to contribute? Yeah. Okay, yeah. you may go on. Well, uh, mandatory education is what I make, uh, is what I want to inquire about. Mm -hmm. Whether that education, uh, grade 12, 1 to 12, is mandatory. And that's what I want to make clarification. OK, yes. sorry. Uh, forget about the nomenclature I use. All I wanted to say is passing from primary one to grade one. OK? If that helps all of us to better understand it, I'd rather stick with that particular description. Um, Honorable Speaker, I would have discussed about uh, the issue of the Ministry of Youths. But uh, before that, Honorable Speaker, I would go to the Ministry of Trade, Integration, and uh, we should be on page 43 of the report. Honorable Speaker, this ministry is very, very important, and it is responsible for investment promotion in the country, responsible for what? Industrialization and also responsible for creating the enabling environment which will encourage both domestic and foreign investments. And it is quite refreshing to note from the President's report that uh, GAIPA, during the year under review, have, that should be on page 44 of the SONA report, Article 9. page 44, article 9, where it states that in the, this, the total investment amounted to $154 billion and also created 2,274 jobs. Hmm? OK, thank you. It generated $154 million and created 2,274 jobs. Honorable Speaker, this is very important. Because without investment in the priority sectors, the Gambia would continue to be a consumer nation. And our quest is to graduate from that level and start producing the key commodities that we need. Honorable Speaker, towards that, I want to make some contributions. GAIPA in its mandate is taxed with the responsibility of attracting investment and creating the enabling environment by giving incentives to these investors that will encourage them. Some of these incentives comes as what? Expenses to the state. 
The honorable member from uh, Sani Mentor and did talk about tax expenditures. When we say tax expenditures, these are the exemptions, these are the waivers that government gives. And they become reductions from what the revenue that was supposed to be collected. Which means that many of these investors, or all of these investors, one of the requirements is they would come with a business plan. They'll make a proposition. There'll be an attached budget. In this attached budget, it will disclose the total value that they intend to invest. And it will also disclose the number of jobs that their investment can create. Honorable Speaker, one thing I want to note is the threshold to be qualified for a special investment certificate in the Gambia is $100,000, which is very, very minimal when compared to other nations. I was fortunate to be part of a team that went to Rwanda, and I can report to you for certain that the threshold in Rwanda to be qualified for a special investment certificate is $50 billion. But, Honorable Speaker, the most worrying aspect is not the threshold alone, but that it is based on promissory note. This is worrying, because today we are reporting $154 billion. This is what was given to the President. How sure are we that all of this investment happened? And that's the next level of my presentation. If at all the Ministry of Trade, through GAIPA, will really serve their purpose, there should be a sound monitoring and evaluation system. When investors come with a very beautiful business plan, you give them incentives. As for these incentives, they'll be qualified not to pay taxes. They'll be qualified not to pay duties. Those taxes and duties would have been revenue for the state, which would have been invested in priority areas. But the government is giving you the opportunity not to pay because they believe that the investment you will be doing in the country will yield dividend that will supersede whatever tax you are supposed to pay. But many a times, what will happen is the follow-up to ensure that the actual value of those investments are made is not done. And, Honorable Speaker, I would like to submit to the Office of the Vice President to really look into those companies who have benefited over the years, who have benefited in these special investment certificates, and let's look at their performance level. Because if you go to the GAIPA Act, in Section 39, it is telling you that the agency will evaluate those companies with regards to what their performances. And why are they evaluating them? So that if they fall short, the certificates will be revoked. So, Honorable Speaker, we believe that the enabling business environment has been created. We believe that the ministry has the foresight. We believe that the ministry have the strategies. We believe that they have the programs and the policies. But moving forward, we need all hands on deck to make sure that those loose ends which needs to be tightened, we do it together. If not, having those strategies alone might not be sufficient to propel us to the next level. Honorable Speaker, I would forgo my contribution in other areas but we'll conclude with the Ministry of Youths and Sports. Honorable Speaker, this ministry is very important, and I would commence by congratulating the minister and telling him he is the most fortunate one for the past 50 years, because this country has been yearning to go to the core of nations, and we are only lucky to be there as a result of the good luck he brought for us. So for that, we are telling you, Jinganyu, yala la yala ar. And uh, again, looking at the report, the president this highlight in his speech that both NYSS and the president's 
international award scheme have been engaged in skills transfer to the youth. And then I think uh, the NYSS have trained over 152 youths. And the President's International Award Scheme have trained over 252 youths thereabout, if I'm right. You know, but today, Honorable Speaker, a greater emphasis has to be given to the youths of this country. Because we all agree that the youths form over 60% of this country. Many a times it is said that youths are the future leaders. But I, for one, I believe that they are the current and future leaders. I believe that every individual is good. I believe that those boys we see outside with their dreadlocks, the boys we meet in the streets in the bush brewing attire, those we meet in the ghettos, those we meet at the beach side, can be equally productive when given the opportunity. Many a times, the problems confronting the youths are coming from the homes. Our society values pen and paper. If you send your child to the school, he doesn't come with good results, what do you tell him? It's a baraka. You don't take it. Not knowing that pen and paper is just an art to give you a profession. That individual is deprived of the counseling, the proper one, at a very tender age. Woe betides on him if at all, at grade 12, he happens to fail. The home will call him an outcast. Society will call him a dropout. Honorable Speaker, collectively, as a people, we should not fail them. That's why I'm happy with the Education Ministry coming up with the second chance. But I'm deliberating on the Ministry of Youth and Sports. I believe part of the strategies of the Ministry should be, let's call it any name, but let it be an outreach program targeting those zones, those hotspots that we believe these youths normally sit. Let us cancel them. Part of our drives also should be to expand the current skills transfer programs that we start. Because if not, currently we are all blaming the Ministry of Interior, that crime is on the rise. That is the effect. But what are the causes? Mental problem is real, and it is here, and it is prevalent in the youths. Society is rejecting them, calling them a failure. And the benchmark for that evaluation is based on what? Education. Honorable Speaker, many people are going to office every day. But at the end of the month, that Senegalese man sitting in my corner, selling cafe tuba, earns more money than they do. All we need as a people, it's a career, it's a profession. So I think it's high time we inculcate that sense of responsibility in our youths. But it must start with a paradigm shift, which requires a greater advocacy, starting from the homes to the society and then to the schools. Honorable Speaker, on that note, I would say thank you, and I beg to take my seat. Thank you, Honorable Nominated Member Keba Lamfufana. Honorable Members, we still have about over 20 names, members, to take the floor. A reminder, I now invite the Honorable Nominated Member Fatou K. Jawara. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for the opportunity. I will also like to join my colleague to commend the President of the Republic of the Gambia and also acknowledge the presence of the Vice President and Cabinet Minister. Honorable Speaker, I begin my intervention 
on Minister of Gender, Children and Social Protection under page 28. Honorable Speaker, with your permission, I would like to quote on the first paragraph where the uh, head of state address, we will remain steadfast, enhance the capacity of women in small and medium scale SME, SMEs by scaling up the Women Enterprise Fund. Honorable Minister, uh, KMC is the most density populated area and all our lands were occupied by settlers. So we have no land for agriculture. But our agriculture is being gained from the market, through the market vendors or our small businesses. But this women enterprise fund, I think is being diverted to the women in the rural area. Uh, I don't think there is any women group in the KMC that benefited from the enterprise fund. So I am appealing to your noble office to kindly cater in case there is phase two. Uh, on the other hand, as earlier alluded by can, my honorable colleague can I from San Mentere. Sorry, can I observe you, please? No. As earlier alluded by my honorable colleague from San Mentere, that there is a market lying idle. I believe we need to know the fate of this market, and I think it's the uh, market of the Federation of Gambian Women that is already constructed and there is no workforce that is being done. Honorable Minister, I will continue with another ministerial department because all the submissions, uh, they are read by the head of state, but they are interministerial submissions. Uh, Minister of Tourism, we also had uh, tremendous achievement by those, the, the, the tourism minister also, by uh, the line ministry taking measures in place by diversifying the sector. But Honorable Six Speaker, I believe the exploitation in the tourism sector also needs to be addressed. It's a case for concern. Our children were subjected to a lot of drug abuse in the tourism development area. I think it's a case for concern for the Ministry of Tourism to address, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, on the area of health, uh, Honorable Speaker, there are a tremendous achievement by the Health Minister. Uh, uh, among them were the community ambulance, and which my community, now my former consequence, Talinding, benefited from. But unfortunately, this ambulance engaged in a serious accident and is no longer in use. And this is the ambulance that is overseeing both uh, Fajikunda and uh, Talinding. So I wanted to know. What is the fate of the minister? Because I already spoke to him and he promised to take action. Uh, on the other hand, Honorable Minister, still on health, as a former vice chairperson of the Select Committee on Health, Children and uh, Social Protection, I believe a lot needs to be done in our health sector uh, that we are not captured in the report. Some of those achievements that I wanted to highlight are, I think we need to introduce a banking in our uh, in a banking in our health sector and a quarterly month quarterly month uh, quarterly report to the parliament so that we can know what is happening there and also we should have a proper procurement specialist to identify our equipments because sometimes we may have equipment in the hospital when they were break we cannot fix them with their parts are not available so i think that one also need to be addressed we need to have a specialist to help us is that problem honorable speaker uh, and I, I think I speak about the gener uh, revenue generated are uh, paid through bank. Uh, that also is a recommendation. Also, the illegal uh, malpractices in the waste dumping. I think we need to, uh, we spoke about this during our sightseeing, uh, we need to relocate it from uh, where, where it used to be. Honorable Speaker, on the transport, works and infrastructure, uh, we heard about the minister's submission. Uh, but I believe many felt that what, is, what belongs to the government should not be accounted for. Uh, I raised a parliamentary question during the uh, fifth legislature uh, that we have a boss lying idle in uh, one of our uh, Peter garage in uh, Latakunda, and the minister promised to take it upon his, himself to look uh, what, what, what transpired. But yet still, there is nothing that was done. The boss is still lying there. I think. You, you, you need to 
you need to you need to check on that also as well. On the other hand, Honorable Speaker, uh, most of your address were centered on construction of uh, roads and rehabilitation. But, but I think one of the burning issues today is the cost of high, high cost of transportation, which I believe the minister needs to address because uh, uh, it's like there is no control mechanism in our transportation sector. Uh, the current sit-down strike of the union is a case for concern, and I think I should appeal to your line ministry and the head of state to easily come up with measures to see that whether they can bring GTST under the office of the president, because uh, Gambia Transport Union is not paying dividend, and I believe uh, it, it needs to come to the office of the president so that it can properly look into. Uh, Honorable Speaker, members also dwell on uh, the, uh, the, 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 the sooner about corruption. Yes, there are corruption scandals that were practiced uh, in the system, uh, which I think there is no genuine uh, parliamentarian who should be mute about that. Uh, honorable Speaker, but I believe the Gambian, community, uh, communi the Gambian people no need to know how far have your ministry gone? Uh, that is the Minister of uh, Local Government. How far have your ministry gone uh, as per the alleged corruption scandal at the KMC? How far have you, have you gone in that investigation? On the other hand, uh, Minister of Lands, I believe the district tribunal also needs to be looked into. There are a lot of, lot of abnormalities taking place in this district tri tribunal. And it comes out of the... Uh, 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 it was set out of parliament to, to help the Gambian people, but sometimes these bad messengers and alcohol will connive to miss, miss, uh, to, to, to miss the file of the, the, the victims of la, uh, land dispute. So I believe you need a serious intervention to address those one also, Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister, on the defense, there is a general outcry that uh, Gambian continue to lose their life. Yes which is quite true, and I think it needs a proper attention. But uh, I believe uh, every child came from a home, and there is no child who is born criminal, but they are copying in, they are copying, uh, in our society. So I believe it's a collective responsibility as parents and as parliamentarian game changers to try and guide our children rather than misguiding them so that the country, the, the country can move forward. Uh, members also dwell on the foreign troops, Honorable Speaker. Uh, sometimes something in me told me whether we are in another planet. Because we were all here when, the, when every Gambian was crying that these foreign troops need to come here. By then everybody was saying that we don't have confidence in our, in our, in, 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 in our uh, security sector. Honorable Speaker, and these foreign troops came here through the mandate of ECOWAS. And we have our Gambian also who went to sister brother countries. So why, when did they turn to be state enemies? And I, uh, I think mem as member of parliament, we should stay away from such statements that we don't need these uh, foreign troops here. They are our brothers and belong to us as ECOWAS family members. So I think those things need to be disputed. Honorable Speaker, and I believe uh, the security also needs to be equipped with, with mechanism to track the uh, to track the crime zones to see the signal whether to, to map out the signals of crime before they occur. So on that note, Honorable Speaker, because many have spoke before me, uh, I, 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 uh, I submit and beg to take my seat. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Nominated Member Fatu K. Jawara. I must commend you. You've said a lot. You've not done any repetition. And within a short time, you are able to complete. I now invite the Honorable Member for Talinding Kunya. Thank you very much. Honorable Speaker, 
first and foremost, I would like to join honorable colleagues in acknowledging the presence of His Excellency, the Vice President, and the Cabinet Ministers here present. Uh, I would like to begin by adding my voice to the debate uh, on the description of this country as transformed. Uh, while I do not agree in total with uh, the point of view that it transformed, I do not also agree with the point of view that it is not, it isn't, it is not, trans, it is not transformed. Uh, in my point of view, it's a journey that has begun. And to say that it has transformed, transformed based on the fact that we have emerged from a, a system and that things that obtain in that system are no longer existing, does not suppose that we are transformed. Because the bar is like we are setting the bar too low. Uh, for me, we cannot also say it is not transforming because we are not where we are five years ago or six years ago. So it, it's a journey that has begun. And we are all on the path to make sure that we attain that transformation. So you cannot be qualified as transformed, but you cannot also qualify it as not being trans, uh, uh, transformed. So it's a journey that is in progress because a government that is ruled or governed on a constitution that is, not, that is described as unprogressive and dictatorial cannot be described as transformed. So as long as we, have the pre we are governing on the previous 1997 constitution that we, in the emergence of this new government, described as a dictatorial with undemocratic uh, clauses, then we cannot say we have transformed. We are on the journey, it has begun, but we are far from being transformed. Now, to, to go to the next finance, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more with the submission of the Honorable Member Fofana with regards to uh, uh, finance. I would just want to add that with, the, with all the formula, for a formulation of robust policies that would set up boovers against shocks and enhance domestic revenue mobilization, uh, that alone is not enough. Uh, to mobilize resources is to ensure also that you don't have leakages. And he elaborated on leakages. But then I am sure uh, this, this country, people, you tend to hear people say there's no money. I, 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 I tend to disagree. There is money. There is money in this country, but where does it go to? That's the question. The money, the revenue that's, that are being collected are going to individuals rather than to the state. So if the state is coming with uh, uh, formulating uh, policies that would enhance domestic revenue collection, a uh, mobilization, it should also be matched with measures to ensure that uh, uh, leakages are minimized. In, in, in all these institutions that are collecting, finally, sometimes Yes, there are institutions that are assigned with the tax collections, but then who is checking those institutions? That's the problem. Who is checking those institutions? Who is playing oversight on their... Who is playing oversight on, on other, other, other agencies? So finance should move along that line to ensure that all the revenue lines, revenue collection points, there are systems with a digital to ensure that we minimize these leakages. And I, I couldn't agree more with the, the, with, the, with, the, with the submission that if we enhance that dom domestic mobilization, it can go a long way in, 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 in helping us finance our own project. And the finance should also help to, to there are some, some tariffs that have to be revised. Like if you go to the airport, there are some, it, it, the tariffs, it gives a range. And this, it's a window for corruption. Like a look, a, 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 an item, so, 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 from this, you can charge from this rate to this rate. So you are giving the liberty 
to the officer to decide when even actually that amount is costing 10,000, but you give the person a range, like it could be from 1,000 to 10,000, then that's, that's a window for opportunity for corruption. So the, the, he can decide to, to charge the person 2,000 and, the, and then get some favors from the person. So that, that, those tariffs, it is existing. And then they are in the crossing points and those tariffs should be revised. It's a challenge in the leakages. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't belabor too much on this finance one. Then, but then, uh, the, 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 the public financial management strategy, 2021-2025, why, why is it specific to councils? I think the idea is fine, it's laudable. But why councils? Why uh, councils alone? Why, why councils alone? I've not seen any, 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 any public financial management strategy for central government. I've not seen any public financial management for SOEs and prostitutes. Do we know how many how much revenue leaks in, this, in, those, in, those, in, those, in those institutions or agencies? So it's not me. Why is it only local councils? That's doubt me. It should be, should be for central government. It should be for, for institutions, it should be for the same way for SOA, state-owned state, state enterprises and prosecutors. We should have the system across the board, cross-cutting. We should not limit it to, to only to the local, local government. I don't know why. Uh, and then I will move for, for, to gain time. Uh, foreign affairs, uh, many people have spoken on the deportation and other things. I would just want to go, you know, uh, somebody said, we have revenue, it's not the problem. Expenditure is not the problem. And, I, and I, I beg to differ with that position. Because my, this is my reason. If you misplace your priority, it affects your expenditure. And then expenditure becomes your problem. How can you explain a government that wants to um, uh, uh, develop agriculture, uh, uh, attains food self-sufficiency, budgeting for agriculture, little over 300 million, and then we have foreign affairs over one billion. How can a country that knows that 60% of your youth, 60% uh, of your population are all youth, and, the, and they, 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 they form the higher percentage of unemployed, you budget in 123 million dollars for that, for that ministry, and you tell me the expenditure is not a problem. And you tell me you want to you want to empower the youth, you want to develop the youth, you want to create jobs for youth. Look at your expenditure. And then, even in, in, the, in the Ministry of Youth, that expenditure, the 100 is personal emolument. I was still correct. The development is 223 million dollars. So 123 for youth, youth ministry. 100 is all recurrent. 23 million is just to develop the use of this Gambia and, and sports. How, where on earth can we do that as a country? 23 million to develop sports, to develop the use there. And you tell me this funding is not a problem. And even in that recurrent, 100 million, 6 million is emolument, 94 million is other, other expenditures, fuel allowance and other things. So tell me, an emolument of 6 million and then other expenditures, 94 million. In the other recurrent, other recurrent, 94 million. That means fuel and other allowance, podiums and other things. So, and you tell me spending is not a problem. So it's the way, if we are yearning for resource mobilization, we should also look at strategic spending. We spend in sectors that are going to revamp our economy. Not just spending for spending, spending sake. Uh, Minister of Health, we have recognized the tremendous efforts that these ministry have done, and then the, 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 the infrastructure developments that are happening. I only hope this is matched by efficiency of service delivery, because sometimes in, 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 in Africa, especially in the Gambia, it has been the trend to concentrate on edifices, structures. We build 100 million facilities, 200 million facilities, after two years service is zero. And then service is more important. How can you spend 200 million, 100 million in a hospital? After one year, you go there, no service. So it's, it's high time we, 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 we focus on service delivery. 
and, pen, and, and stop building massive structures with a lot of millions, and then we don't, people don't end up having this quality of service they need. We've seen, I've crossed the length and breadth of this country, and I've seen the, 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 the performance of, of medical personnel. We have to commend them, especially those that are in the hard to reach areas. I can rest assured that these people are competent people serving our people in the, in the provinces. With the little things, with the, we know we, every sector is constrained, especially health. Somebody tell me, uh, everything is health, but anything without health is nothing. Health is not, health is not everything, but anything without health is nothing. So health is important. It's paramount. So we should focus on quality, quality service delivery in our health centers. And our staff in, in, in the provinces, they are, they, are, they, are, they are quarters where they live. It's important. And then sometimes I don't understand the attitude of Gambians. This has to do, this is not about government, it's about people, our ambitions of people that government train to serve, to provide service for people. You are trained as a nurse, you are trained as a, as a, as a, as a doctor. You are not ready to go for posting. You're not ready to go to posting. You go for posting, you say the condition is hard, you, you come and bring yourself here. Some people go on, 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 on self, self, uh, sorry, leave. So ministry, the attitudes of Gambian also must change. To serve our people. Gambian must be ready to serve their people. You are posted at, at Gibanar. Go there and serve your people. I was amazed the, 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 the in charge I see in, the, in Kiang, in, in, in Gambisara, in other places, the in charge and what they are ready to do for their people. And they are all from Congo here. They are on posting. But it's a challenge sometimes to get some of these nurses to, to, to stay at their post, post, post time. This is a challenge and we must, we must encourage Gambians to take up that responsibility. People are sick, distance from health centers are very far. So if it, it is managed to have a health post somewhere, the personnel should be ready to sit there. This is something we must, we must recognize. But I, I am disappointed in, in some of these speeches because health is doing a lot of things. But then it's, it's like some things are not captured. Uh, I think we want to know what the health is doing with, with regards to addressing the doctor-patient ratio. This is alarming. This is something you, I know is working on, but it has to be captured. It should reflect, it should reflect in, this, in the present speech. How, are doc, how many doctors do we have with, in contrast to the, the, doc, the ratio, the nurse-patient ratio? We know there is scarcity, but what is the training program about? How many doctors are we training in the different fields, in the different specializations? These things is, is national concern. It should be embodied in the, in, the, in the speech. So the other issue in the speech also is health issues. You know, the, 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 the rate of diabetes is a concern. The rate of hypertension. And just recently, the medical office, you know, the ministry has discovered a kidney problem. And then they are doing efforts to ensure that to know how it is caused. And then this, this diabetics, these high bloods, we should know, is, is it from the, the, the foods that we import? We should look at the bigger picture. Because if the, what we are eating is causing this problem, if we are not eating healthy food, it, it, has, it, it is increasing the, it is increasing the cost on medical expenditure. So we should know the correlations. So these things, it's important the nation's presence address to capture those things, to talk to the people about those things. So far, the health is, 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 is moving on, and we encourage that the, the path they have adopted, they, 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 they continue on that. But then I would not agree that the bad situation is a success. Yes, the idea is notable. And we must recognize the innovations that are coming from the Ministry of Health. Yes, that's true. The innovations that are coming. But then let's maintain, maintain that when these, everybody got their bad uh, insurance card, we, 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 we ensure that the long-term achievements with regards to accessing medication without those cards is realized. Because it's one thing to have all people, everybody get the card, it's another to have, to have, uh, to have the system running. Sustenance is always a problem in Africa. Uh, Honorable Speaker, Ministry of, Ministry of Petroleum and Energy, and I will join them with Ministry of Water Resources. 
Uh, we've seen, we've recognized the, the various tri uh, tremendous efforts being done to, to increase the, the power supply, especially in the, in the area of renew re renewable energy, solar system for, to be specific. And then the number of villages, the number of villages uh, that are programmed to have this 675, and this is good. And then I must recognize the efforts of the, uh, the, the executive to separate the electrification section and the water division, meaning now it's now, now, it now to be divided into two corporate, corporate, corporations. The water division, the water area, which is independent body and the electric side, to be independent of each other. I think this is good. Because for me, I think NAWEC as it is now is overwhelmed with issues. NAWEC is overwhelmed with issues. And as we go in now, we, for the past six, seven months, we have this perennial water shortage going on. And then, yes, there are, the, the, the president raised that there are efforts being uh, taken to address those things. But before that happens, what is happening now, it has to do with something with, with life. Because to, to, to take their own initiative to solve this water shortage, people are now building boreholes everywhere in these communities. Whether those water are fit for consumption, we never know. And then I see a reform, Water, water Act, that is in the pipeline. So this department, water resources, should ensure that people, wherever boreholes are meet, the water is portable. The water is fit for consumption. Not everybody dig borehole everywhere. And then the, the funny thing about what is happening now, people are being built for what they have not consumed. While we are waiting for government intervention, this problem is continuing. The greater Banjo area, no water. People have to stay 3, 3, 3 a.m., 4 a.m., the whole night. Drops of water will come. So it is high, it's, 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 I think this process should be expedited. Whatever programs are on are, are put should be should be should be expedited. Expedited. Now, uh, higher education. Uh, and, and, and the two ministries, I will join them together. People have spoken about the results, and then I've seen the the people measuring performance based on past. I'm not saying the performance is, is not bad, but the measuring aspect, I don't think it's a good practice to measure performance based on, you say, this year we have improved because last year we have it. It's like if you are going to Bache, today you are at Westfield, next week you went to uh, Abuko, people ask you, you are not traveling, you say, no, but I was to out Westfield, and today I'm back, I'm moving. But are you reaching your destination? That's the problem. I think education has a target. They have a target with regards to passes in subjects, the overall passes in terms of enrollment. So just to say there's an increase by 400 students, you're saying that's an achievement. I say no. What's your target? Are you moving towards your target? So I think the, the, the measuring system is, 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 is possible, it's, it's not correct. We measure based on yardsticks, where we are heading to, where we want to go, are we going? Are we moving towards that? Let's not say you because we are better than yesterday. If yesterday was worse, today you are just fair. You are not even, it's just fair. So that's, that's not a good point of this thing. So the, I, the schools are being constructed everywhere. That's fine. Excellent move. I'm not, I'm not sure whether this construction of schools are being accompanied with libraries, with, with science labs, with labs and libraries. These are basic, most important elements in school structure that are lacking in public schools. No lab facility, no, 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 no library. We have to adopt the culture of reading in schools. And students will be able to access material. And then the ministry to start to, to have budgets for libraries in their schools, in, the, in, the, in their schools. Look at the, the only national library we have. Look at, go there now, today, go there. It's just across here. Look at it. What is higher education doing with regards to those ones? 
You got to the library in, 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 in Brikama. They don't even touch the schools. What about science lab? So it's important that we, 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 we look at all those things when we are planning for, it, for the development of education. And also, the, these applied sciences, you know, uh, if you, we, we, we are turned GDTI to, to a university, I think we should also provide in high schools a breeding ground to feed that university. And then you go to certain schools now, the technical departments are weak. Students are not even seen as something that, is, that, that they, they should go in for. And then government is our responsibility to ensure that we make those, we, we entice students to go in for these other, other areas. You know? I don't want to belabor too much on those things. Youth and sports, like I have said, you know, we, 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 we have to give prominence to this ministry. And they have to take the lead in ensuring that they bring programs that are, that are, that are designed to alleviate the youth, to give jobs to youth. Yes, there are other programs that are needy and other things. But if we, we want to say our budget, most of the crucial sectors, we have, we have to depend on the donor fund. When they are not forthcoming, what do we do? What do we do when they are not forthcoming? So, and, and even those needy projects and this, this techy fee, I, 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 bet, I want to think you go and check how those, those, those projects are, 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 being, are, being, are being given. So that we know that they are given to the right individuals who can do justice to, 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 to those projects. Because it is funny sometimes you see, you see the project people building, sorry buildings, building, having uh, plastic vehicles, and the, the, they tell you figures that practically you don't see. We, we've given jobs to 2,000 people. Why 2,000 people? You never see, you never see the impact. So I think so somebody, people mentioned here, these oversight things should, should, be, should be strengthened. Now, uh, Office of the Vice President, I want to just talk about national disaster management. People talk about it, and they talk about having a budget line for it. That is important. But then for me, I want to have long-term solution. Because we cannot have a budget line for just disaster. That means we are expecting disaster every day. Yes, they do happen. But there are issues that, you know, it's, it, it becomes recurrent. It happens every year. Disaster sports that are there every year, you know when it's rain, it's going to be disaster. What do we do now? We're going to have keeping, keep phones every year so that when they, when they are flooded, we go and give them 7,000. That's not the thing for me. The thing is, what, what is the cause of that disaster around that end? If it is people blocking the waterway, they must be demolished. If it is roads, because sometimes these roads, that these new roads that we construct, sometimes bring havoc in terms of... No, allow me to. <laughs> you know, the, this road, let me finish this one. This road that we construct, sometimes it's like the engineers do not survey the landscape of our, our, our environment. The problem is we are still in that problem in atrocious town level. Anytime it rains, traffic is obstructed, people go. Some of the floods in, in some part of the area are due to the new roads that are constructed. Are, are proper feasible studies being done to look at the landscape and look at how to uh, uh, avoid future problems of, 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 of flooding. So I think these things have to be look, looked into so that we know the root cause of disasters in some places and to, to finance something to mitigate, to, to, to eradicate floods in, the, in, in, those, in, those, in those areas. And then there is this issue with the Department of Physical Planning. And these things, I, when I come to local government, I, I will highlight those ones. Honorable, Honorable Speaker, Minister of Trade, Industries, and Regional Integration. In the, in the President's uh, uh, speech, uh, he, let me quote uh, page 43, uh, paragraph 4. To promote stability, the ministry is working with importers to increase importation and supply of essential commodities and stabilize economic, uh, commodity prices. And then I will, I will link that with the next one on, on it. So it's like during the pandemic, we've all seen the impact of uh, the cost of commodities. Uh, and then, yes, this is, this, is, this is laudable to ask importers to increase what they are importing. 
you know, but there must be drastic measures taken at the level of that ministry. You have few people monopolizing this sector. And it, it creates what they call barriers of entry for common Gambians to enter that one. And this is something you may not, you may not see. It's not in the laws, it's nowhere, but they have the support of the ministry sometimes, the people in the, in the, in the trade. People tell you that I want to import rice, but I try everything, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't penetrate. People tell you I want to bring this, I want to bring this, I want to bring this, I couldn't even penetrate because our institutions are helping people to monopolize this sector. And this is wrong. Government must establish, so must make so the trade is liberal, is free, and there is high competition so the price can come down. Please. You count who and who and who are importing sugar and rice here. You count them, there are few. And you don't know that Gambian cannot enter, enter, enter into this. Government must, must encourage that. Government must encourage Gambians to, to go into all the old businesses that we find there are no many competitions. So this is something that, 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 that we, we, we should recognize. And again, even, even at the level of, of, of our market, government, in the present space, there are a lot of markets built. Yes, but how, what strategies and policies have we adopted to make sure that, that those markets are filled with Gambians, with the resources to make a business life in this country? Go to our markets and who are there? In the, in the market, every day, or every, by every two weeks, these women traders, we call them Gendenjai, would go to the neighboring con uh, uh, country and import not less than uh, 200,000, 300,000 worth of uh, 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 vegetables to come and sell in our market. What is the Ministry of Agriculture doing to feed that market? What is trade doing to ensure that you know, we assess what our market needs in terms of local produce and make sure we invest that in agriculture to feed our market? This is how we should be thinking. You come to even even in the particles and nomis, you have a lot of farmers there who produce, but then to have market around here is a problem. The neighboring country will come with trucks and buy from Nomi, Badibu, and take it outside. Our market will, will lose. You know why? Because when, when we are producing onion in abundance, and then these importers are importing, there must be a policy to ensure that at what season do we have how many, how many, how many local producers of onion do we have in this country? What, how many volumes can they produce? And at a certain point of the year, we should spot, stop importing onion until our local produce is finished. Our neighbors are adopting it. Now, if our local producers are producing onion, we still allow this important to import onion, how do we promote gardening? How? Our, our actions are not matching. Because these people that don't have store, if they keep it long, it will perish. So they give it a give away policy. They remain poor. So our actions should match. What we produce locally should be consumed before we have uh, uh, other, other goods coming to interfere in those, in those distinct. So the, the, the statistics uh, like labor force survey is done in 2021, the speech fails to inform us about that. What are those statistics? We need to know. We need to know as, as representatives of the people, you know. Yes, let me, let me just cut it short here and then finish with local government. The, the next I can finish it with adjournment demand to give chance to others. Yes. Uh, Minister of Local Government and Lands, Honorable Speaker. Uh, uh, you know, let me tell you, honestly, I think this cabinet is good. So far, I've not seen the, but the composition of the cabinet. For me, if, because the President has said it, the President has said it, he relies on the expertise of the people he appoints. And these are the ministers and the, and the permanent secretaries and the so he is a good listener. He said he relies on ministers. So he may have made good selection this time. And I want to, yes, I, I want to acknowledge that. And then this Ministry of Local Government is, is, is one ministry 
that has not been prioritized from First Republic. This is where the Ministry of Lands are. All the problems we face in this country is because we, we neglect this ministry. All the floors, all the poor land planning, bad town planning, everything. It's as if Gambia is not planned at all from independence. No road, anything. Imagine there was proper planning of the, of the Gambia from independence, good roads, good road network, and everything through this ministry. So the, for me, that's, that's how I see it. So we cannot continue to let that go on. Let this ministry take its rightful position in the development of this country, and then let the executive give it the support it deserves. Because this is also where we have the decentralized governance, go government system, and this is where the taxpayers are. So we cannot continue to play lip service to this ministry. The ministry should come up with lands, we, 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 with land policy. We've mentioned this earlier, and we cannot continue to be saying it's in the pipeline, it's in the pipeline. There are a lot of issues here that are in the pipeline, in the, in the, in the, in the Ministry of Defense. I don't want to talk about those things. But let's expedite issues. Time is not on our side. So here, this ministry, this government is held for democracy. It's held for maintaining rule of law. Any chapter or sector, sector of the constitution must be respected. We are here. As a, 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 an act of parliament is being violated. And that must cease, Honorable Speaker. When the act of parliament said 25% of the development budget of council should be given, it should be honored if we respect the rule of law. Now, how, 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 they should be, how they should be answerable to the people, that remain, depends on the mechanism put in place. But you cannot say for how many uh, councils are receiving this, how, how, there's no law that says you should ask council how to spend the law. They, the law says when they bring their budget, 25%, you should do it. That is law. If we are not doing that, we are not respecting the law. So we, we have, that, 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 that's an issue. Go, go, to, go to some regions here. You think you are not in the Gambia? Go to some real issues. You, you think I, that reminds me. The government, the president's statement said 600 and something for, for rural electrification. But in terms of water, the water resources do not tell us anything that they are going to do apart from Nagat. Go to, go to, go to, go to Kuntawur region and other regions. 365 villages, only 60 will have gold, portable water. The rest, zero. What is the department going to do to provide portable water to those communities? What is stopping Nawek to, 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 to do tender, to, to drill boreholes? Boreholes is becoming expensive now. We've seen, we've seen uh, council spend 600,000, 420,000, you know, on boreholes. What is stopping Nawek to compete in this to make it cheaper for people, for constituencies? So it is, it is very important that we, uh, we enforce decentralization, otherwise we will not go. It's very important we respect what the law says. If we have anything to do with those development, 25 percent, we come to parliament and change it. But as it is now, it should be given. And then you are not giving them your 5,000 areas. And then if you are not doing it, because those people put what they want to do for their communities in that development budget, the, the amount of well, we've seen it across the board. We are from top. Some are delivering boreholes, some are doing uh, feeder roads, some are doing bridges. So how come if you want to develop people, look at their budget. Give them the support they need. Some councils are doing greatly. We, I, 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 I can tell you that. But the area council, you know, all the councils, they are trying with the minimum resources. How else do you think they can mobilize the resources if central government do not support them? This is imperative. It has to happen. So I plead on Mr. Speaker uh, to ensure that we, we support, uh, 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 we will support the government. Our role is to support the, 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 the president and his IAA. But the support is to tell the truth. Because the government, the achievement is all of us. The failures is all of us. So we have to tell each other the truth. And there is something the president 
said in the opening that you as NAM should champion development initiatives and programs in your, in your constituencies. Some of your activities are happening there, you're not aware. And that is wrong. But then, there's something, a practice that has started here, and since the president in the Senate, you should champion it, that practice is to empower NAM to do that. That's this constituency development fund. It has been very effective. Some MPs are here, they won't back because they implemented it properly. Even if can, they can increase it to one million, even if it can be increased to one million, it's worth it. It's a good practice, and then the checks and balances can follow to ensure that you implement it properly. But then it's a good practice, it, 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 it ensures that the taxpayers receive the benefits. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Talindin Kunya. I now invite Honorable Member for Jara West. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. I also want to use this opportunity to thank the President for fulfilling his mandate by coming to the Assembly to address the Assembly and the nation at large on matters on development agendas and policies. I also want to thank the Vice President for taking much of his time since yesterday to listen to parliamentarians. I also want to thank all the cabinet ministers who are here with us since yesterday. I say thank you to my colleagues, honorable members. Actually, honorable speaker, um, most of the um, discussion I want to dwell in, um, my colleagues have at least taken almost 99% of it. And then I can see um, we still have a lot of speakers who want to come. But I also have, um, I want to use this opportunity to also add some of my own input or appeal to the government and ministers on the report by the President. Honorable Speaker, the President talked about infrastructural development, which is very key in our country. During his deliberations, he said his administration has rolled out a massive reconstruction program of markets and growth centers that is on the infrastructure. Yes, Honorable Speaker, our own capital, that is Jara Soma, everybody can attest that it is the second capital in Gambia. <laughs> yes, we have a new market there. We have a new market, according to the report, it is true, I've been to that market and then it's very good, it's very nice, but we are appealing to government to bring a lot of developments like that because if we have them there, it is a very strategical location and it can bring development for the country at large. Honorable Speaker, still on infrastructure development. I would like the Minister of Works Infrastructure to put consideration on the road network that connects the villages of Kabada. I want the next sauna, let it, you know, we see it in the sauna. The next sauna here in the parliament, we want to see the roads of Kabada in the sauna. These are villages that are interrelated. And this is, um, these are villages on the right-hand side on the Trans-Gambia Road, when go coming from Banjul, going to Jarasoma. People living in this part of the country are all interrelated and always visit each other in most cases. And also, 
Soma is their center where they can have, they buy their rice, foods, anything. They need to travel from their villages to reach to Jara Soma. Then I know the government, according to my findings, um, it is in the plants, but not only plants. We want to see that road from Kiang area up to last Jara is where Kabada stops. Honorable Speaker, still on infrastructure. Honorable Speaker, I was on a tour with the regional government select committee and I visited far places after Basset where I enjoyed very good roads. Honorable Speaker, I have some friends who live at these villages before, if they were traveling there, you know, it took them two days before they reached there. But this time when I go there, I can see, you know, development, infrastructure development is moving in this country. We can all see that. People who live in Sudwal, when they were going there, they used to suffer. But I was there these days, I was very happy, and then I want to thank the government we need um, development structures like this. We need infrastructural development. When we have them, we can develop our country. Without good roads, we cannot move to anywhere. So I thank the President on that intervention. Honorable Speaker, I will elaborate on the issue of health. Honorable Speaker, I want to use this opportunity to thank the President and his health minister for a major achievement that is the introduction of the Gambia National Health Insurance Scheme. That is very, very important for a country, because it is data. Honorable Speaker, still on health matters, I would like the Minister of Health to look into the affairs of the Soma Health Center. We want that health center to be upgraded and receive major cases but not any case that is major have to be transferred or referred to Farafanya General Hospital or to Banjul or to RVH, I can say. We want major cases to be attended in Soma facility, for Soma Health Centre. If it is the personnel, we need them there. If there is no equipment or, you know, medical items that are in other health centres, major health centres, that are not in SOMA, we are asking and pleading to the Ministry to help us have these funds in Jara SOMA. I, I believe it is the only major health centre in the whole of LRR, so this thing has to be looked at so that we can also feel safe, not only moving to the North Bank or to Banjul here. Um, to have all these necessary items, equipment that I, I mentioned that. Um, Honorable Speaker, I also want to thank the President for giving us a brand new ambulance, which is serving... Point of observation, Honorable Member. Which is serving my community. Honorable Member, point of observation. I'm not giving you. <laughs> this is something that is... Honorable Speaker, that we, point that, of you know, Point of order. May I hear the point of order, Honorable Member? Standing order 28A. Standing order 28A. 28A. A speech should not be read. Yes, a member shall not read his or her speech, but he or she may read extract from books or papers in support of his or her argument. All right. Honorable... Uh, okay. Uh, it's 28-1. Do you allow me? Not 28. Honorable member, can you take your seat? 28-1. 28-1. Honorable member, you are reading from a paper? If we are reading that you must... No, Honorable Speaker. 
Yeah, just listen. What of the speakers Honorable here? Honorable member, listen. If you are reading, desist from reading. Please. You can you can quote, you can make reference, but you cannot read from documents as you debate or give your speech. You can continue. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I am very sorry to... I don't, I, I don't want to go back to that, but then I believe all the previous speakers here, they wrote something that guided them when they were speaking, and it is the same thing that I have done. To judge what I'm speaking, you are doing that. So, leave me to go ahead. Honorable Member. Honorable Member. Honorable Member, point of the visa, I'm, I'm also from LRA. I want to support uh, uh, Please, Honorable Member. Honorable Member. Yeah. If you, uh, if you, if you, you can have your jottings. Very good. No problems. But you cannot be, you cannot be reading a prepared speech to be reading it. So if you are reading, you desist from it. If you are making reference to your judge, you can continue to do that and then you, you speak. Please, go, go ahead. Thank you, Speaker. Honorable Speaker, on education, um, according to the report, the President with the government have done tremendously good in building good classrooms and then teachers' quarters. Yeah, we all know the President have mentioned how many classrooms we have and then um, teachers' quarters. This is very, very important because before Teachers were struggling when they are posted at the rural Gambia to get a, a, a good house where they can live. But today, you can see teachers are enjoying in their quarters. I can attest to that. Honorable Speaker, still on education, I would appeal also, I will, I will use this opportunity to appeal to the Minister of Education. In the whole of Kabada, we have almost 64 villages, but we have no senior school in Kabada. We want to have a senior school in Kabada. Honorable Speaker, aside from that, I have a message for all of us, all the citizens of Gambia. For me, when people are banging and saying, we love this country, sometimes I say no. Honorable Speaker, I don't know how can you be in a country, you are seeing something good, developments, but you don't want to acknowledge them. Some, a speaker said here, you can see somebody in a position, a, a leader, you are heading an institution, but you want to sabotage just for failure. It is not correct. We are all living in this country. My honorable uh, colleague yesterday said, there is somebody calling for this country to be on fire. If it is on fire, you think you will be safe? Let's be very genuine. Not only sweet words, we have to be very genuine. Point of order. Point of order. Point of order, honorable member. Uh, who, who is who? Thank you. Honorable Speaker, uh, uh, 29.5 of the Act 29.5. No member shall input uh, improper motives to any uh, other member. I think the honorable member is, is inclining to that, uh, to, to that end. I think every, every honorable member in this house is very genuine. He is not imputing any motive, no, he sir. He said we should be genuine. Honorable. Means some honorable members in this house are not genuine. He's not, he's not imputing any motive. Every honorable, 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 honorable member in this house is genuine. Honorable member, thank you. Honorable member. Read your order properly. Read your order Please, properly. honorable members. How many times do you, want, do you want me to remind you people? Honorable members. How many times? We are being watched from around the world. 
Honorable member, I don't think the, the honorable member is out of order. So many statements were made here on the same footings. In fact, people said here that uh, Gambians are corrupt. It's general statements. So those are very common. Just go ahead, honorable member. Thank you, speaker. Honorable member, let me put it to you. No, I just want to say this. We are all equal here. I respect each and every person's opinion. I say we citizens, we Honorable member, please continue your debate, please. A ruling has taken place. Please. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I want to um, stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Yara West. I now invite Honorable Member for Old Yundum. He's not here. Uh, the Honorable Member for Banjul Central. Um, Honorable Speaker, thanks for uh, giving me the floor. Um, I first want to observe the dignitaries here within our miss, Honorable Ministers. Um, I would say um, it's a pleasure having you here, and, it, and that um, since in the morning you guys have been here with us, it means that uh, the commitment and the drive uh, is really in there, and this is something that uh, we have to really acknowledge. Um, I would just like to uh, say that I have heard that the Minister of uh, Tourism is currently uh, in UK uh, to console the royal family. So I would just like to say, if possible, he would at least rekindle or ignite uh, reparations <laughs> for uh, the 400 years of you know, slavery that have taken place in the <laughs> in <Norman. laughs> I think that is of importance as well. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would just like to say that um, we really appreciate the um, State of the Nation address from the President of the Republic. It was, uh, it was well put, uh, and uh, that his, um, uh, his mandated um, duty, that is Section 77, Subsection 1 of our Constitution, uh, that mandates him to uh, at, least, if, at least once uh, stand before this August gathering to deliver the State of the Nation address. Um, however, um, the, the address highlights the policies and programs, but also the challenges uh, of, the, of the government in terms of uh, project implementation, among others. Uh, however, I would also like to acknowledge that there is no, um, there's nothing like a perfect document, right? Uh, and that everything, but everything to do us look good in paper. But sometimes, do they, do they um, relate with the current realities? That's a question we have to answer. So among our core parliamentary functions, scrutiny. And I think in as much as the document is good, our role and responsibility is to make sure at least we extract the cherry from the chaff in making sure we at least help the government to accelerate its uh, mode of efficiency. Um, Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, one thing I've also learned in Parliament is um, not to speak last, because if you give these parliamentarians time, they would <laughs> they would take everything that you have noted down. So, um, in order to save time and to give uh, other space, and have also seen some among our, our uh, the members are also almost dosing of. I was seeing Honor Busar was almost off. He's actually sleeping. So I'll just make sure I uh, save most of what I have to say uh, for the adjournment debate, but just to highlight a few things that I've put in down. Um, so I'll start with local government, uh, Lance. Uh, I quote from the President's uh, speech 
that are uh, rolling out of the IFMS to local councils uh, to improve fiscal management. This is quite very important because um, I would um, just like to um, elaborate a bit. Um, my uh, co-parliamentarian did make mention of that, that uh, we recently had a, uh, a rollout, a provincial, provincial uh, tour, whereby we got to see firsthand uh, the level of uh, implementation in terms of the local councils. And we have to say that um, most of them are really doing great. Uh, however, uh, we've seen that the lack of subsidies from the government is really taking a toll on them because it's uh, preventing them from implementing most of their projects, which is really hindering their, you know, the efficiency of the, their work, actually. Um, also, um, we've seen that um, the only um, revenue uh, uh, generating streams that they, uh, they have currently are rates and license. Apart from that, um, they are con some, some have said that the current sand mining process is being taken place within their, within their areas. Uh, or else have been uh, saying that these local camps, uh, the revenues generated from them are also going to the tourism ministry directly. Uh, so what they are querying, their query actually is that there are multiple revenue generating streams that can be tapped from their, you know, from their local councils, but really um, the autonomy isn't there for them to explore them. So these are areas that I think we need to really uh, look into. Um, I would like to say that um, uh, in terms of uh, local government still, uh, Banjul as the capital uh, of the Gambia, I think um, uh, most, will, most usually argue that um, we are a bit privileged in many things because uh, most of the things uh, or uh, development um, processes are um, done within the greater Banyul areas. But I would just like to highlight that when it comes to development, uh, in any country you go, the capital city depicts exactly the, the fissure of the country. So Banyul, uh, in as small as it may be, is really of much importance to this social economic development of the Gambia. So um, we also have our challenges in as much as uh, this uh, um, road rehabilitation program is taking place and others. Um, we lack uh, a housing housing spaces are not available. Um, if you would, uh, pay notice that a lot of people are leaving the capital city to go and find you know, uh, housing in the combos and other areas, uh, which is uh, really taking a toll uh, in the capital. But also, we also have problems in terms of uh, these stores that have been built all around, uh, really the spatial demarcation in terms of Banyul to separate um, the, the private areas, that is the residential areas, from the commercial areas. Because in most countries, when you go there, the commercial areas are usually in the outskirts. For example, if you, if you are coming from Combos, coming to the Banyul, um, along the Mile 2 areas, those are all uh, commercial areas that can be utilized in making sure that at least um, the inner areas of the city uh, is, uh, is habitable and also to at least for government to at least uh, partner with the local councils in creating a housing project that will at least um, house certain number of people, at least even uh, those, that are, those, are, those that are residents and, you know, bo that are born in the capital can at least relocate from the areas they are in and um, uh, return back to um, their, their homes. Um, also, um, uh, I want to make mention that in terms of uh, local government, um, we're really having problems in terms of um, allocation of these spaces, especially to foreign nationals. Um, because um, uh, there was this incident with our local councillor, uh, whereby um, there's this store that, that was taking place, an alt altercation took place, whereby the foreign national actually told, told a Gambian, a citizen that is here, and an authority that, um, you know, Fini man malafi opakar in your own country, you know, so which, which is really disheartening. So these are all measures that we really have to take and also revisit our acts and also in terms of giving out contracts and all those, giving, giving too much space to in, a certain individual really need, need to be looked into because I think everyone has a share, has to have a share of the national cake. And also uh, together with the um, National Assembly, the Local Government Act need to be revisited. Uh, I'll come to that uh, in the adjournment debate. I don't want to waste much of our time. So um, I would like to delve also in terms of the recent house demolitions, Honorable Speaker. Um, I think an authoritarian lapse did take place uh, because um, these are individuals uh, who have gone through the 
normal uh, land acquisition processes. You know, they've acquired their lands legally. They have legally binding documents. Uh, and these spaces also were ac acquired through the SSHFC, which is a government entity, right? And if you pardon me, um, if you go to the um, Gambia Physical Planning and um, De Development Control Act, it states, I quote, section 22, subsection 4, uh, no person shall, shall enlarge or alter an existing use without first applying and obtaining a development permit in accordance with this act, which means that these people didn't just randomly settle, settle there, but they went through all due processes in making sure they acquired, acquired these lands. Uh, after that, what happened? They were given short notices. They were given short notices, and their houses were lost. Their settlements were lost. Their houses were demolished. And the query from the ministry was what? That um, these houses were constructed along waterways. These are lay people who don't have any technical know-how of exactly whether their houses are constructed in a waterway or not. And it's the, I think it's the uh, duty and responsibility of the physical planning to make these proper findings in making sure that prior for, before them acquiring these lands, they would have told them that this area is, can, cannot be used as a residential area because this is a waterway. So giving them these permits and then again coming to demolish their homes really is a kind of a double standard. So it makes no sense. I think this really needs to be looked into. And I think their rights have been violated to the max. Um, and personally, I think before anything, I think a negotiation phase should have taken place, right? Whereby they would discuss with these people, um, try to manage with them, find a relocation zone whereby they can be relocated temporarily whilst uh, things will go on, and eventually uh, then work on a compensation method whereby you know, an agreement can take place. But just to give them a three-day notice and just demolish their homes, I think that's a big uh, violation of their rights. And this is something that we really need to work, work on. In terms of education, Honorable Speaker, um, we've all made mention of, uh, in terms of uh, the erection of new facilities, new educational facilities, classrooms, uh, increment of teachers. These are all highlighted in the, in the, in the President's speech, which is, which is good, to be honest. Um, but I think um, our main course of action should be we really need to look at the core curriculum and the subjects that are really um, you know, transmitted to these kids. Because the thing is, I think um, personally, I think we, we, we lack Afrocentric subjects in our curriculum. Because most of these things, most of the um, uh, things that these kids learn are usually external, um, you know, from external sources. I think um, the sense of nationalism really needs to be incorporated into the, in these youths at a very tender age. Um, I was opportune to visit China in 2019. And you would, you would be surprised, uh, a small Chinese child will be sing, singing their national anthem and you will see tears dropping down. Because the, nation, the sense of nationalism was incorporated in them at a very early age. And this is what they grow up with. And that's why if you go to China, you cannot say anything. You can't tell them anything. You can't corrupt them. You can't manipulate them. Everything is China first. So I think that sense of nationalism should be incorporated in the educational curriculum at a very early age. Let, let the youth know their history. Let the kids know their history, the background of the country, where we came from, where we are heading. So as, as they grow, they'll be able to be more nationalistic in the, their outlook and the way they view things, which is, will really help the country in moving forward. I also think that um, career guidance needs to be incorporated into the educational system. When I say career guidance, I'm, I'm, I'm taking myself as an example. Because most of these kids you say, um, some of the courses that they are doing, they are pursuing these courses just because a friend of them, friend of theirs, perhaps is doing a certain course and they just like to follow suit. Because the thing is they weren't properly guided as to knowing exactly what they, what they are good at or, or the direction that they need to take pertaining to their expertise. So these are areas that I think we need to work on. And also in terms of the uh, counseling aspect, I think the parents also need to be counseled. I would remember when we were kids, I, I actually attended a private school 
Uh, I think this also happening in public schools. But I, uh, parents meeting usually was convened on a periodic, uh, periodically, whereby you know uh, the, the headmistress will brief the parents on the current standing of the school and the school trajectory, the status of the kids, and all those stuff. I think um, these things need to be accelerated in order to at least um, uh, bring the, uh, the parents as stakeholders towards the uh, development process of the, of the youth. Now I move to environment, Honorable Speaker. Uh, I would like to congratulate the government on being recognized as on track with regards to the Paris Agreement. This is really a milestone that needs to be acknowledged. Um, but I would also like to say um, that uh, uh, a large portion of this recognition has to be given to the CSOs of Gambia. Because these are environmentalists, these are youths who are running day and night in making sure they are in the forefront, in the climatic push, in making sure that the Gambia reaches its milestone in terms of uh, the climatic, uh, climatic aspect. So I think um, uh, in as much as the government have really done their part, I think really the CSOs, uh, the environmentalists, the environmental groups, the Envir Gambian Environmental Alliance, among other groups, have really uh, pushed the narratives in, in putting Gambia in the forefront in terms of the climatic push. Um, Honorable Speaker, um, as we, as a country, as we gloat globally uh, of um, honoring the pact that was our benchmark that was set on a global stage, we have our internal woes that is lingering within our eyes and nobody is talking about it. We've seen the com commercialization of the Tanbi wetlands. We've seen the dubious sand mining going on within our midst. We've seen dry docks being, um, being laid on top of waterways, on top of wetlands. We've seen parks, deforest uh, with regards to our deforestation drive, we've seen uh, parks and wildlife spaces gone, uh, notably the Monkey Park. Um, Banjul is a meter above sea level. What does this mean? This means that, um, God forbid, if there was a wave coming from any direction right now, currently as we speak, a wave, just a meter or above a meter, will we'll all, we'll all sink in. This is, the, this is how dangerous this thing is. So these groups that are fighting tooth and nail in making sure uh, they are doing their contributions through tree planting activities, you know, through advocacy, and so many other domains. Um, these are things that really need to be highlighted. And I don't think, um, really, we're giving it due, due diligence. Um, the issue of the flash floods, I'll save that later um, uh, in the adjournment debates. I don't want to enter the specifics right now. Uh, in terms of defense and security, Honorable Speaker, um, I would join my honorable colleagues in asking the question. I don't know what these foreign people these foreign uh, um, soldiers are still doing here. And what's more alarming is, um, number one Marina Parade is our house, all of us. That is the state house. In most countries that you go, I would say it's quite risky to bring foreign nationals inside the Oval Office of any sitting president to be able to you know, be cognizant of the whereabouts or the in and outs of that particular, that particular house. On a security, I'm not security minded, I'm just speaking as a layman. It is quite alarming and I would say that the, the openness of the Gambia right now in you know, deploying these foreign troops, I don't know if there is a security threat that we are, they are not um, telling us, if we are under threat. Um, I think it's better to come out and tell us if there's any security threat that is going on currently that we are, we are to know. But speaking from a layman's term, um, I don't see any reason why our security forces can't be utilized. Because um, they've been showing maturity ever since. They are disciplined, uh, they are courageous, and internationally respected as well. 
and they've, um, and they've demonstrated the highest possible level of maturity during the impasse. Because there was a point whereby there was a thin line between chaos and stability. And it was on the hands of our military, and they've showed discipline and maturity in making sure we are here today to, to be able to speak. So I think that area needs to be revisited as well, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Speaker, um, I don't mean to be sarcastic, um, but I don't know if you've, um, if you've actually watched the movie Money Heist. Honorable Speaker. <coughs> it's a question, Honorable Speaker. Have you watched the movie Money Heist? Are you questioning me? Yes, Honorable Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable oh. Member, put yourself in order. Oh, sorry, Honorable Speaker. <laughs> sorry, Honorable Speaker, for being sarcastic. Actually, um, I was just making a point that there's something called the uh, Great Gambian Heist, which is our Banyu Rehabilitation Project. Um, Honorable Speaker, the project is dubious, it's untransparent, and it's, it has deficiencies in every, every other way that you would put it. I think it's a big lapse um, on the government um, of single sourcing a project, the pre-financing aspect too as well, and commencing of work of the project even before contract signing. Also, this is the first time in history I've heard of a project without any blueprint. This, this Banyu Rehabilitation Project that we are gloating about. I wouldn't go to the specifics, I'll save that later, but I'd just like to highlight it. Um, and also, something very important I want us to take note of, Honorable Speaker. There was an audit query with regards to this project. And we all know um, that the, the National Audit um, is a key National Audit Office is under the government and is a key component in this country. So they've come up with this query. That is, they've extracted some deficiencies within the, within the project. So I just can't understand. With that query, I would thought that if a presser or a press conference were to, to be called, it would be centered around calling the contractors, calling the consultants, putting them on board, and asking them questions as to we, had, we have a query from the audit office to be able to at least justify these things so that at least people like myself that are, that are having, you know, um, I would say um, bad vibes with regards to this project will be at least enlightened about it. But what happened? A press conference was convened and you would see cabinet ministers and government officials coming to defend the project. And all I saw uh, on, the, on, the, on the board were just slides, before and after pictures. There were no specifics of exactly what the project is about. And Honorable Speaker, when it comes to projects, there are what we call project specifics, project specifications, whereby even a road, even a road that is to be built, or even a single cement, the, the size or, or the type of the cement to be used, or the road, that, that the thickness of the road even matters with regards to project specifics. So these are all things that are usually highlighted in the project grouping and the project contract. So our not being consist, cons, um, cognizant of these things really proves this project elusive. So we are at a dilemma right now, and really I think the government needs to take accountability in making sure um, this project is really looked into rather than just defending the contractor or those that are involved in this project. And Honorable Speaker, it's not, it's not sometimes bad to be able to acknowledge your faults or to say, I think we made, a we made a mistake on this, we'll try to rectify it. I think that's what makes us human. So I think the government should take accountability on, on that. Um, with regards to COVID-19, Honorable Speaker, um, it's very important to know or to follow where our monies are going. Honorable Speaker, um, 
The government promised to pay victims of the TRRC, I think 150 million in 2022 budget circle. Um, from our statistics, 956 victims were identified for reparations and to be paid around 205 million. In addition, uh, 32.4 million uh, was put aside for the 54 uh, West Africans that, were, um, uh, that lost their lives. So these payments were not included in the um, 205 million cater. So under the 2023 budget estimate, Honorable Speaker, only 100 million is indicated under the centralized services, which shows a deficit from the presumed amount. So I think these are areas that we really need to into in terms of these fiscal lapses. Uh, we'll save the specifics as well. Honorable Honor, Honor, Member, I think yes. you better pass through your hands. You know, what, what I think we should do is, you rightly said, you have some of these things affecting your areas and these things. You, you leave it to the adjournment debate. Yes, and we speak speak holistically with what the president has presented to you. Yes, that, that's, why, that's why I said I'll save the specifics till the adjournment debate. So I'm just speaking holistically at the moment, Honorable Speaker. Uh, okay. Honorable Speaker, in terms of um, uh, Minister of Finance and Economic Affairs, uh, it's highlighted that the national debt, in term, under the national debt, uh, 1.9 billion uh, was um, sourced as an external debt payment. Uh, 3.1 billion was highlighted as a domestic debt. So the debt service increment is said to be uh, of 11.1%, um, which is quite uh, high, uh, which means that this year as well, um, this, uh, the percentage will increase. I think, Honorable Speaker, we need a debt ceiling as a country, and also uh, focus should be given to the local authorities or the local councils in making sure revenue generating streams are put through to, to be able to cater for certain areas, and also pay dividend um, to the government. Honorable Speaker, in terms of remittances, it is alarming that 40% of our total revenue comes from remittances. Uh, which means that um, the diaspora um, zone really uh, is a sector of itself because 40% of our total revenue definitely it's like it has outgrown most of our um, uh, sectoral sets in this most of these ministries in this country we are outgrown with this 40% 40, 40 revenue so I think the diaspora community really needs to be looked into honorable speaker uh, and we always advocate for this uh, seventh region that is of the diaspora. And I think the, uh, the rekindling of the draft constitution has made provisions of all these things and really need to be looked into. Honorable Speaker, Office of the Vice President, um, I, would really, um, I, I would really like to uh, applaud the government because um, it's highlighted that um, a performance contract initiative will be initiated whereby this will help um, in assessing workers, uh, but also, most, important, most importantly, their efforts will be recognized uh, and um, incentives will be given. I think this will really accelerate the push uh, towards um, giving workers drive and also um, getting the best out of them in making sure their, um, uh, their, their work-related um, uh, issues are put down. So, um, also, I would like to just conclude by saying that um, uh, this flash, current flash force has really um, um, showed uh, lapses in terms of um, contingencies. Um, I personally were one of few who had to uh, take off my parliamentary suit and um, uh, join my fellow colleagues in making sure we do our best in curbing the um, the, the flash flood impact uh, that really had big effect in, in our constituencies in Banyul, together with the Honorable Member of Banyul North, and we did our best in making sure we mitigate at least a certain section before the government uh, came to take things over. So I think um, this uh, should serve as a uh, to serve as a lesson for future um, unforeseen circumstances 
And I think a proper disaster management strategy, as put through, as put down, it needs to be really accelerated. Uh, and also a contingency framework should be put down in making sure that future disasters uh, are looked into with immediate effect. So on that note, Honorable Speaker, I will rest my case uh, and leave, let others to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Banjul Central. At the onset, you made me believe that you were taking five minutes, and you lasted for almost 30 minutes. Honorable member for Nyamina Dankunku. Pardon? He's out. Honorable member for Basse. Honorable member for Basse. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the opportunity to contribute in this debate. First of all, I have to thank the President for upholding the constitutional right that he's supposed to be appearing at the Parliament once in a year to give a statement or a national address. The next is to also to thank the Vice President for considering the constitutional mandate 77.3, which he shall step in or represent the president on national matters or matters affecting the president, and his cabinet ministers for being here with him as technical supporters to him, and because most of these informations or statements relates to their line ministries, and I think they will be better equipped, at least technically, to support the vice president when it comes to issues to be answered. Okay. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I have to look at the most demanding ministries, that is the Ministry of Agriculture, which is Ministry of Agriculture and Ministry of Health, which have a direct impact on the citizenry or the people of this country. Mr. Speaker, in the agricultural sector, I think the government and the ministry have done a great job by, by overhauling the, the and prioritizing projects that are very meaningful to the, to the society or to the communities. Mr. Speaker, making a reference or quoting in page 12, page 12, number 5, that it states to boost the, the incomes of the incomes of farming households, the government has in the past five years invested invested heavily to to modernize and transform our agriculture sector as a result through donor funding projects the sector has was able to reach 300 communities and also given 6000 hectares of rice production and also 400 for vegetables. And I think these are the major areas which I think they are the consumables ones within this country. That was a very good step for the ministry and the government of this country. Mr. Speaker, the other steps which the ministry also have taken at least to improve on the agriculture was looking at the, this, the, the, the storage facilities which they started to embark on and also the, the feeder routes 
which also they also started to embark on. Because most of the time, most of these women who engage in cultivating these vegetables, their concerns was accessibility to the market. Because they all have the zeals and commitment to do this farming and harvest a lot of vegetables. But their concern was how do they have access to the market in time and sell their vegetables. Because I was an eyewitness, a, a community like uh, Bintang in uh, is it this place? Phone, yes, phone. Yes, there was a community which they were asking for support, like boholes and other things. When we took the bohole there, but they said, yes, they can't even manage with bohole, but their main concern was road connection to their market. And in that, they said, at times, they have difficulties when they travel from that area to Brikama. By the time they arrive, they will find all the wholesalers have already buy what they're supposed to buy, and they leave. So they have no other choice but just to sell at any price so that at least or even give it as a loan until for the following day or the following week to come and collect their money. And I think the Ministry of Agriculture have done a very good initiative that is trying to at least connect these feeder roads to, us, to, to make sure these women will have an easy access road to, to market their vegetables. Mr. Speaker, again, I also want to remind the, or help the, uh, tell the Minister of Ministry of Agriculture, or the Minister, that is, in those days, there was this storage facility in communities, and that was addressing most of this disasters which is happening right now. Because by then in communities, you have this community storage where, whereby whenever they cultivate, they keep all their proceeds in those, in those storage. And those, those storage are now facing out. That's why when, they are, when there is a flood or fire disaster, most of the communities, all their uh, proceeds perish away. So I think the Ministry of Agriculture should look at it and see how best they can revitalize these local storage facilities within these communities. Mr. Speaker, looking at the health sector, which is a key ministry under this government, and I think people will attest to that. Looking at the previous health sector and the present one, at least it has been improving. It improving in a sense, looking at the three areas, like the structure, the capacity and the human resource, those areas are really improving and I will applaud the government of the day for making those things to be improved. One is the, capa the capacity is like, for instance, this hospital, the main hospital, everybody knows in those days, every region you can only find one hospital and you can, at times you can even call it as a major hospital. Nowadays, you can go to any other region, you have hospitals, you have daycare centers, you have other clinics within those, within those regions. At least the, the government have made accessible or make, take the, 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 the medical sector to their doorsteps and try to ease the burden of people traveling from one region to another. In those days, even URR, when you have major, major, major referrals, you have to bring your, your patient to Bantam. At times, it's difficult. But nowadays, most of those areas have been addressed. Mr. Speaker, on page 16, on the health sector, the, I differ with one of my colleagues here who said the mortality mortal rate or childbirth is increasing day by day. And the very day when the president gave the speech on that day, even some child, there was child, ch ch child birth that we, I, I, I differ from. 
I was one of a member who was part of a survey team in those days when the child birth and mortality was, the rate was alarming, WHO and others have to step in to at least try to conduct a survey. And I was part of that team who went to URR under the supervision of uh, my brother who was here, Falunjai. Looking at those days and now, I think there's a big improvement. It's just because now we are, there's a lot of visibility with this social media and so on, but Going to this hospital. Honorable Speaker, an observation, please. Can I observe? Allow me to continue because there is no time and people are people want to go. So, Mr. Speaker, I think the health sector has improved a lot. And again, at the capacity level, we have seen uh, number four of the statement of the, the, the president that now you can be in the Gambia and obtain higher certificate when it comes to nursing or being a, a, a doctor in, in, whilst you are within the country. In those days, if you are not from a rich family or you don't have a parent or, an, or a relative who is well connected to the government to help you secure a scholarship for you to go outside and have your, your, your doctorate when it comes to medical, it was, it was a big problem. Nowadays, you can be in the country, and whatever level you want to acquire, you can have it here, unless you want to further more. And I think the government of the day must be applauded for that. On the human resource, before you go to these hospitals, you find foreigners there. At times, far away around URR or CRR, most of the communities, they cannot speak English that much. And even for them to express themselves, to the doctors so that the doctors can diagnose them and give them the right treatment, it was a problem. Because most of them could not or cannot speak our local languages. But nowadays, you can go to any other hospital within this country, you find well-qualified Gambians, nurses and doctors who can attend to you and take care of your needs. Thank you, Mr. President. But, one thing also I also want to, is a concern which I want to raise to the, uh, to the minister. That is the, the ambulances. It was very timely and it has made big, big effects because it has a lot of issues relating to scarce of transport within certain areas or even the type of the, the specimen of the vehicle that was what that was uh, uh, supplied in looking at the, the 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 nature of our roads the some of the roads are not good but the specimen at least they are very durable and they can serve long for the purpose of what they are meant for but my concern was when these vehicles were brought maybe it could be an oversight there was no logistics or operational policy that can tell the people how these vehicles or how these ambulances will be used, their routine maintenances and their fueling. That is what was affecting some of these communities. Who should fuel them or who should, when should they go for maintenance? And I think it was an oversight and I know it was a signal which, which reached to the minister and I know it will be addressed because I spoke with him. The other proposal I have for the, uh, for the, for the ministry or the minister is, I think the, it's high time now the ministry should try to at least institute a supervisory or a monitoring unit within the ministry, like how the other uh, uh, education ministry did. Because nowadays, people must be monitored constantly because people, the less of their attitude is increasing day by day. That is affecting the people. That is why some of our colleagues have been alluding, repeating that as attitude and change. And by instituting this unit, it will help. Because uh, depending on the, the nomenclatures you're going to use, whether you're going to provide every region to have a supervisory role as like the education did, 
or it will be centered on Banjul and will be going up and around, up and going to, to, to inspect most of these major clinics and other areas. But it is very important because one, they will be looking at the, the, the facilities, the equipment, and they also look at the, 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 the medical store, that's the, the, the medicines. Because at times, you go to other, other, other hospitals, you will find some medicines there, and other, uh, some of the doctors will tell you, or even the, 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 the nurses will tell you, maybe the, this type of medicine is not here, you have to go and buy it outside. That's why people capitalize on it, and they went right opposite the hospitals and built their pharmacies there. And I think the ministry should fasten his belt and try to institute this, this, this unit, because it will help. It will also look at the services or the operational mandates of the doctors, the way they serve within the institutions or within, uh, within these hospitals. Because at times, doctors might leave before, before time and you need to call them up. Because if you are in the Getabanyu area, maybe you are exposed to so many people who knows how your, your, your operational operanda. But with, down there, they take it as an advantage. Maybe people, I'm, I'm, I'm the boss there, or I decide at the time and when, when to come and when to leave. So with this supervisory uh, unit, we'll address those areas. And also looking at some of the equipments within the uh, hospitals, they'll be also be supervised and be monitored on, 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 on routine uh, uh, lines, whereby at least they'll also report on areas. Because at times you have these equipments they have problems and they will line down there. Nobody will, will report to the, to the ministry or to, to, the, to the director of medicine that this equipment have, a, have an issue. Because some of them, they will not have a lot of regards to it. Mr. Speaker, in doing so, I now look at uh, Minister of Three. Minister of Trade, looking at page 43 on the statement of His Excellency. I don't want to be reading because I'm just trying to at least minimize the time because in the, in the, in the labor force, uh, the Minister of Justice, a few weeks ago, he was here on the Labour uh, document, which we are reviewing to, to, to endorse. But again, and I told him on that day, that at least, thank God he said they were reviewing the Act on the, on the, labor, on, on, on the labor Force. But again, I said, when reviewing the act or whatever you are doing, you have to protect the citizen because, because here people, people are, the citizens are not protected. Investors will come from outside and come. There is no clause that is protecting our, our citizens when it comes to job employment. And looking at those areas, I think we should at least try to secure or protect our citizens when it comes to these uh, uh, foreign investors. Because other countries, when you go there, there is a clause whereby there are certain key positions that must be occupied by the citizen of that country. By doing so, if, if, the, CEO, if the investor is the CEO, then the, 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 the general manager must be a citizen of this country. If the technical man is, is, the, is part of the CEO, then the finance must be a, a Gambian, whereby they will be looking at the interest and they will be at this on making to look at the interest of the Gambians and their, and, 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 and their security. Because any, 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 any uh, uh, genuine somebody, if you are looking for a job, there are two things which you put into consideration. That is your job security and your future. If you are looking for a job and there is no job security and there is no future, then I think you should, you should look for another, an, an, another uh, institution. Because you cannot be, there are certain institutions you can be working there for 10 years, you cannot be recognized neither to be promoted or even to be, to, to be considered. I think those areas 
must be considered. Because that's why nowadays, every now and then you have this petition, people are sat, one, uh, uh, one sole uh, proprietor, you will employ him to the, the following day, he sat, and there will not even notice. People have been petitioning, going to the labor, and there's nothing coming, coming out from it. But if this clause is in place, at least it will protect them, and also it will serve their interests. Mr. Speaker, looking at the youth and sport, the Honorable Minister, his intervention into the ministry have paid a dividend because one, he feel, one who feels it knows it. He was there as a youth, he served that institution, that's why he's making a progressive development in that institution. But again, there is one unit within the ministry, within the ministry which is really lacking behind, or they are not doing some of their mandates in that institution. Because the ministry is building the capacity of the youth, training them, giving them entrepreneurship training, giving them opportunity, giving them loans. And I can remember the very day at the I-22 when so many youths were given scholarship, 100% cover, with their, all their stipends and everything to go and study. And which was a difficult moment in those days for people from nowhere to, to get those opportunities because by then there was a selective justice. If, if, I am not, if, if my brother is not in the ministry, it is difficult for me to get that scholarship. But those people who were awarded those scholarship, I don't think even the Navy director knows where they come from. But because of their applied, and they were qualified to be awarded those, those scholarship, they were given those, those scholarships. So I think I applaud the ministry. But again, the concern is, at the sport council. I think the sport council, uh, honorable minister, you need to look at that institution or that unit very well. Because that unit is serving you as a regulatory body and also capacity building for athletes or sports. But looking at that institution, only the individual athletes or association which is growing as in associations or, 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 or athletes. But the council itself is stagnant because now they cannot even regulate most of the associations, most of the associations within their purview. That's why most of these associations now, they are seeking subventions in the name of the Gambians, in the name of the Gambia, and at the same time, spending this, these funds without being questioned, without being even audited or whatever. And looking at the act, at least every year, all these associations must go for AGM and at least clearly spell out how they spend the money subvented to them through associations or through international organizations. What they will tell you, yes, you don't, you, don't, you don't subvent us. We get our funds from outside. That's not the case. You are using the Gambia to get those funds. And you are within the Gambia. You must be audited. And you must submit your reports. And I think the, the Sport Council should step up and at least try to at least get control of these associations and monitors their incomes and expenditures. But I know some of the things that is lacking, that is their act, which I think is under review. And I want you to expedite that as quick as possible for the acts and their policies to be updated up to standard. As you said, it's on the way. And I want you to speed up on those ones so that at least they can be enacted and we move on.
The other uh, area is that is the legal sector. Mr. Speaker, Honorable Minister, justice delay means justice denied. If you go to most of these magistrate courts, you find piles of cases lying there getting dust. At times, the way and manner some of these magistrates they operate as if they are an island. They come at any time they want and close sittings at, or, 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 or courts at any time they want. I was a victim. I have a case at Brusubi. Somebody, uh, how to call it, stole all my rams and I took my case there. I end up even forgetting about uh, going to the courts. Because every day I pay my fare or use my fuel to go to the courts, and what I hear or the, the, the magistrate will tell me, today I, I did not come, my, my film excuses. I end up even forgetting about that case. So I think the, 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 the minister will look at those areas and see how best they can be adjusted. Because justice delay means justice deny. Mr. Speaker, I just look at the Minister of Finance, that is the new minister have really done good because looking at the Minister of Finance, they were all along looking at other areas which they were sidelining the most important component, that is the revenue policy unit, which the current minister just instituted recently and looking at our revenue sector. And I think that will help us a lot because this country is a tax revenue country which we are relying almost 80 percent for our daily day-to-day -day expenditures. And again, there are so many leakages within this tax or revenue collection areas which I think with, the, with this unit they, they will come up with strategies which can address those areas for the betterment of this country. Because if these areas are addressed and all these tax areas, our revenue collections are controlled, and I think we, this, the, the issue of grants or loans will be, will be minimized. So let's put a lot of empathy, controlled mechanisms to see this country call up the right revenues and put it into the right direction. That will help us and reduce the loan or the grant areas. So the, Vice, uh, Vice President's Office, that is the NDMA. Uh, Mr. Vice President, I think the, the, the NDMA, disaster, they need a risk management department within their unit. Because there is no risk management department in that unit, they cannot assess risk, and they cannot even tell you risk exposures within the communities. Because if there is a risk management unit, those departments will be going all out to look for risk exposures, and they can be advising the department on those risk exposures at least. Because addressing a risk is cheaper than uh, risk advert is, is cheaper than uh, 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 risk payment. Because to avert a risk is cheaper than to pay a risk. So I think the, the unit to, to institute a risk department management is, is key because most of the time, every year, the same places will be having float or will be having issues, problem upon problem because the risk department is not there. So I'm advising the minister to at least sit with the, the NDMA management or leadership at least, or the director to institute this unit, which most of these uh, uh, institutions are now uh, instituted into their departments, like the ports, GRE, and others. They are all now having risk man management department unit, which is very important to most of these risk exposures institutions. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my last contribution is that is the Minister of Works with the NRA, and I think the NRA should help us very well. Because looking at our these contractors or routes which they are constructing, 
I think that area also needs to be looked at very well. We are good at building good roads, but again, the sustainability is the problem. To sustain is a problem. And I think those things must be considered. Our, in, our engineers, they are the issues. The engineers are the issues because Basse feel the same, have a problem when it comes to engineer. Looking at the contract which was awarded to, to Basse, it was that ECOWAS project from Bilingara to Basse. The, 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 the ECOWAS committee only hired the, the company to build the roads, but the engineers, the, every country must provide its point, own engineers. Point of observation? Point of observation? No. Allow me to learn. <laughs> uh, so this is your game, to, obstruct, to, to distract people. You cannot succeed. So uh, for, for Basse, and I think the engineer compromise for Basse, that's why right now we are facing that difficulty on the road congestions because the specimen was compromised. And also, I'm also advising the Honorable Minister for Works to look into those things and let him be very strict on this, uh, 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 how to call it, engineers who are attached or who are directly working with these contractors on these road consortiums, which because it's the Gambia, Gambia government which is going all out to get these grants or these loans in order to build these roads. So we want the, 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 the value of that money to be, to, to, to be benefited by the, by, by the community. So I'm applying, uh, appealing to the Honorable Minister to put those things into due consideration. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honorable Member for Basse. Honorable members, I, 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 I want us to look at the way we approach issues. You know, individual members are making recommendations, recommendations to the various ministries, and uh, your recommendations are even different. On one issue, somebody will recommend it this way, somebody will recommend it this way. What I was suggesting is, we look at this from a holistic perspective, policy programs then your recommendations that you may come to the Ministry of Health will come through the, the, committee, the health committee and you will debate your recommendations.